It is 11. 39 on April 5th of 2024, the state and local government and veterans committee will come to order. Um, we have a lot to get through today. I would kindly ask any testifiers to um, keep their testimonies as concise as possible so that we can get through all of our agenda items. First on the agenda is Senate file 4782. Senator Port will be presenting online. Senator um, sorry, I forgot to mention we do have a quorum, which is why we began. And as Senator Port, if you could please begin. Good afternoon, uh, Vice Chair Mitchell and Chair Dietzik and members. Thank you for allowing me to present to your committee virtually. It is my honor to be here today to present Senate File 4782, the first ever Office of Cannabis Management Agency Bill. I do have the A11 to move, and uh, I would like to offer an oral amendment to be incorporated in that. Senator May Quaid moves the A11. The A11, um, can I hear the oral amendment? Yes, um, so it is insert a period before the second comma on line 1.16, delete everything on 1.16 starting with the second comma, and delete all of line 1.17. I am hearing from council you said that wonderfully and they do not re need to restate that. Um, but I want to make sure everyone has the amendment. Does anyone on the committee need the technical changes that she added to the amendment restated? I am not seeing that we need that. Senator May Quaid moves the A11 amendment. All in favor? As orally amendment. As orally amendment. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The amendment is adopted. Senator Port, could you please um, continue with the bill also explaining what we have added in with the amendment? Yes, the A11 amendment um, gives municipalities a priority for temporary license if a temporary license remains after social equity applicant, temporary license are granted. And a temporary license held by a municipality would not count towards the total number of licenses uh, issued by a local government, that cap that we put in to allow them um, to say no once the need has been met in their area. Uh, and then it also makes other technical changes uh, recommended by the revisor's office. Um, and to continue with my uh, explanation of the bill, so if you recall last year, we did historic work to start correcting the harms and failures of prohibition. Throughout the 2023 session, the bill was heard in 14 committees, took 65 amendments, and became one of the strongest cannabis laws in the nation. As I said then, it won't be the last time the legislature hears the cannabis bill. Prohibition of alcohol ended 100 years ago, and we still hear liquor bills every session. This newly legalized and regulated industry is in its infancy, and we're here to continue the work we started last year. In partnership with a brand new Office of Cannabis Management, this bill improves and streamlines the licensing process and supply chain. It strengthens our social equity goals, accelerates the transition of enforcement, infrastructure, and resources, and it expands protections for medical patients. The portions of this bill that fall within this committee's jurisdiction cover just a few main ideas. The first is the transfer of duties from the Commissioner of Health to the Office of Cannabis Management. That affects many sections, mostly with conforming changes due to the date change to move this forward. The next piece uh, is in Section 33, which allows the director to appoint two deputies and removes the salary cap. And finally, Section 45 and 49 clarify rulemaking authority. 
As always, I look forward to the discussion and to future partnerships with you all on this bill. And now I'll turn it over to the OCM Interim Director, Charlene Breiner, for some deeper insight on the agency recommendations. She and her staff are here to uh, answer questions as well. Thank you, Ms. Breiner. And as you come down, if um, uh, Ms. Shimpa could also please uh, take one of the chairs and be ready to be on deck, that would be lovely. Uh, Ms. Breiner, at your convenience. Thank you, Madam Chair. It is a pleasure to be before this committee this morning. For the record, my name is Charlene Breiner, and I am serving as the Interim Director of the new Office of Cannabis Management. I want to thank you, Madam Chair, and committee members, as well as Senator Port, for the opportunity to walk through the specific provisions that are under the jurisdiction of your committee, and uh, I will get started. The goal of our legislative recommendations is to really strengthen the underlying foundations of the robust provisions in Chapter 342. We've used two primary lenses in developing these proposals, the first of which is our goal to implement in a timely and effective manner uh, the new cannabis industry, and secondly, to develop a regulatory framework that will allow us regulatory efficacy over the long term. Um, we have placed our recommendations into several buckets, primarily changes to the office structure and secondly, uh, improvements to the application and licensing process. So I'll focus uh, my presentation this morning and we'll try to be brief, uh, Senator, but some of them have a little bit of detail, so I will uh, try to be as brief and succinct as possible. So let's start with the changes to the office structure. OCM is recommend, uh, recommending, as Senator Port mentioned, the acceleration of the transfer of the Office of Medical Cannabis from the Department of Health to the Office of Cannabis Management. Current law calls for that transfer to occur on March 1st of 2025, but we're recommending an acceleration of that program, transferring OMC to OCM, those acronyms continue to be a challenge, uh, transferring, accelerating that transition to July 1st of 2024. Similarly, OCM recommends accelerating the transition of the temporary hemp enforcement that currently re resides at MDH uh, over to OCM at the same time. Several sections throughout the bill address this proposal through authority references and transfer language to support data and the employees who are currently doing the work. By amending 151.72 directly, we keep the current temporary regulations in place as we continue to build out our licensing structure. And then after we have adopted OCM's rules, uh, hemp-derived product retailers will operate under the provisions in the licensing and enforcement structure in Chapter 342. These changes support the transition by allowing for early integration of staff, consistency and enforcement, continuity of operations, building our foundational capacity at OCM, and provides a bridge for continuity and patient access uh, for patients and the medicines they depend on. As we prepare for transition from a registration system to a fully licensed medical program, an earlier transfer of the program helps us build that continuity. Additionally, we recommend modifying the structure of the office by replacing the references to the Division of Medical Cannabis with the office. The plan is to retain the medical program in full and the division of work, but it's important to have the authority of Chapter 342 rest wholly with the Office of Cannabis Management to maximize our capacity and effectiveness. This structure modification is included in several sections throughout the bill. Finally, OCM recommends amending the authority of the director of the office to align closely with that of similar state agencies. The changes grant us the authority to make appointments and establish deputies, allow, a better, allow us to better leverage external and federal funds that are applicable, and provide administrative authority under the director. Recruiting and retaining top talent within state government requires us to have the same authority and flexibility as other state agencies, and it will allow my, uh, the person who succeeds me in this role to actually operate and lead the agency with the same high standards of efficacy that we expect from all state agencies. Um, next, as we previewed in the, annual, in the annual report, it was our first ever annual report to the legislature in January, uh, OCM recommends, recommends some changes to the order of operations in the application, application and licensing structure. Uh, 
This is designed to give better information to our local partners who are very critical in launching this industry and ensuring regulatory efficacy. As part of our efforts to determine how to best operationalize Chapter 342's application and licensing process, we worked to develop a licensing system and worked with our subject matter experts to streamline and improve this process. And I'd like to walk you through it uh, just so you understand both what currently exists and how the change actually uh, would impact us. Currently in Chapter 342, the first step for somebody who's applying for a cannabis license of any kind is to go to their local government. Um, however, that process asks, lo asks local governments to make decisions without any sort of information from OCM about whether or not this is a viable applicant or whether they're actually on track to obtain a license. This creates kind of a risk of a who's on first and also uh, provides some lack of clarity to potential applicants that we think we can uh, minimize by reversing that order. Under our proposal, we change that so that the first stop an applicant makes is with the Office of Cannabis Management. They submit their application in accordance with all the criteria in Chapter 342 and the rules that we are currently in the process of promulgating. Then once applicants have undergone our own due diligence at the office and been selected for licensure, the second stop will be the local approval process in the municipality in which they choose to operate. They are required to secure all local approvals uh, from that locality, and those local governments would have the ability to access our licensing software system to complete a feedback loop for a seamless communication uh, and process that removes that uh, potential for bottlenecks. Only if an applicant meets all local zoning ordinances will OCM then issue the final approval for a business to begin operating. By clarifying and setting a clear order of operations, we think that we make the process easier for applicants to understand at each step of the way. We prevent bottlenecks and delays, and we also provide our critical local partners with clear information from which they can make their own decisions. For example, rather than a potential applicant pursuing local approval first without any assurance that we we've done our due diligence, this new process uh, helps local governments know which applicants have been vetted and selected for continued path toward licensure. Directly, directly related to our application and licensing improvements, OCM recommends changes to the local retail registration process in section 56. Uh, the coordination with local partners is critical in uh, in this entire endeavor, and that's why OCM is proposing changes to provide clarity between the role of state regulators and the role of local enforcement uh, to make sure that we have a comprehensive system of effective regulation. The office is going to have a field team of inspectors that operate statewide uh, to manage enforcement of Chapter 342's rules and regulations for retail locations. And it will be important for consistency for state inspectors state inspectors to lead and enforce this work. Um, while providing this clarity, the proposal also maintains the important role of local partners in developing and enforcing their own local ordinances, including the use of compliance checks, age verification, and monitoring for public health and safety. Finally, as part of our efforts to uh, review I'm sorry, uh, as part of our efforts to improve the process, we propose streamlining the medical retail license and instead substituting it with a new medical retail endorsement for license holders. This creates the opportunity for additional access points for medical retail sales while preserving the existing benefits for medical can cannabis patients, including the tax exemption and patient consultations. Um, finally, there are several technical changes that I'd like to briefly cover. In section 32, the proposed change is designed consistent with legislative intent for OCM to be able to amend and repeal the rules it promulgates. Section 45 intends uh, to ensure a mechanism for the office to have access to background information on potential civil and regulatory offenses of prospective applicants in order to inform our selection. In section 46, we propose modifying the background check process. The intention is to separate the responsibility for review of license applicants and holders 
uh, and cannabis workers. OCM would conduct the background checks for all licensed applicants, and uh, the BCA would conduct those background checks for cannabis workers. And then finally, in section 49, the proposed change amends the license selection model and instructs our office to utilize rule to outline the clear application and selection process based off of the application components in 342.14 and 342.18 that already exist in statute. And with that, I will stop and happy at a later time to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much for that thorough explanation. Um, before we begin, if uh, Ms. Schrader or Schroeder could come down and be on deck, and then Ms. Shimpa, please um, state your name and title for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chair and members. My name is Amber Shimpa, and I'm the CEO of Virio Health of Minnesota, one of Minnesota's medical cannabis licensees. I was personally present on July 1st of 2015 when we served the first medical patients in the state. And for the past nine years, uh, it's truly been an honor to lead our team while we've served over 55,000 uh, Minnesotans with compassionate care. I'm really proud of the way we have supported my home state with our community partners. We have advanced medical research and supported expungement and clemency efforts. And we have a nine-year track record of providing jobs for hundreds of Minnesotans uh, and supporting labor peace under a CBA with a local 1189 UFCW. Uh, we applaud the work that went in to crafting last year's adult use bill and in delaying the initial groundwork for the launch of adult use sales. The bill contained many common sense outcomes, such as streamlining efforts to expunge nonviolent cannabis offenses, generous home grow and possession limits, and the creation of the medical combination license, which allows up to 90,000 square feet of cultivation capacity. Achieving a successful rollout of an adult use program is a challenging undertaking, and we have seen programs fail when the process begins to pit applicants and stakeholders against each other. Our shared responsibility as stewards of cannabis in Minnesota is to be stronger together. Uh, this isn't a zero-sum game or winner takes all. Uh, the successful industry really does depend on, upon the folks both competing and working together to have a robust supply chain. Uh, and this supports good business, good product safety, and brings consumers to the regulated and taxed market. The demand for cannabis in Minnesota will be large enough to enable success at every level of the supply chain, but a minimally viable market launch with a slow or tiered issuance of licenses and an inefficient dual supply chain will put a successful program implementation at risk. Establishing licensing timelines for all license types now will provide all applicants the visibility needed to ensure the success of the market. Consumers want access to quality products at affordable prices and making sure supply is adequate to meet this demand is crucial to curbing the illicit market, supporting public safety and generating the tax revenue. Unfortunately, last year's bill lacks a clear path to ensuring continuity uh, for access for the medical patients in the state. For some patients, medical cannabis is a vital component of managing symptoms and living a fulfilling life. A responsible rollout in Minnesota must ensure that medical patients can continue accessing the products that they rely on. Existing medical operators like Vireo are already experienced with the unique demands of regulated cannabis markets leaning on our experience and operations while also supporting smaller businesses and social equity applicants will help ensure adequate supply to meet consumer demand and prevent the illicit market from thriving. This will allow continuity for medical patients, enable success for small businesses and social equity applications, and protect hundreds of Minnesota jobs. Minnesotans deserve to have choices in their cannabis industry and a responsible, common sense rollout uh, which you fully utilizes all available infrastructure can and should be part of this program's implementation. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. <clears throat> Mr. Taylor, if you could come down while we proceed with the next uh, testifier. Uh, Ms. Schroeder, Schroeder, I believe, is virtual. Oh, yes, I see you. If you could, uh, I think, unmute, unmute yourself and then state your name and position for the record, please. Yes, thank you. Um, Good morning, members. My name is Marin Schroeder, and I am speaking today on behalf of Sensible Change Minnesota, a patient and consumer-led advocacy nonprofit. Through my work with this organization, I also served last year in the unique role of Coalition Director for MN is Ready, 
the uh, former statewide coalition of stakeholders working in support of full cannabis legalization. In that role, I spent hundreds of hours meeting with stakeholders and subject matter experts to develop policy recommendations, many of which you will find now in Chapter 342. As this proposal tra travels through its various committee stops, I am disheartened to see dismissal of the, some of the work that was done to ensure a successful launch and a thriving and equitable cannabis market in Minnesota. We have a medical cannabis program that is the smallest in the country, which does not grow and will continue to limit access to safe, clean cannabis products until licenses are issued under Chapter 342. Given this proposal and the current timeline for implementation, patients will continue to suffer along with the businesses who have begun preparing for a meritorious application process. Much of the focus over the past few weeks has revolved around the term well-vetted lottery, which is a proposal contained in this legislation. While lotteries have worked really well for retail and other consumer-facing license types, it takes a significant amount of capital resources and knowledge to operate cultivation and manufacturing facilities. In the states that came before us, much of this infrastructure existed through medical cannabis programs, but that same infrastructure just doesn't exist here in the cannabis space beyond the two companies that are legally allowed to operate right now. We need to ensure we are issuing these critical licenses and endorsements to highly qualified applicants in the early stages of Minnesota's cannabis industry. Plainly stated, if we don't have qualified cultivators and manufacturers, we don't have a viable industry. Patients and consumers need access to safe cannabis products, and the sooner we have an operational industry, the better. It is my hope that over the coming weeks, we continue to engage in conversations that guide us to resolutions that work for our stakeholders. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Mr. Taylor, if you could please state your name and any affiliation for the record and proceed. My name is Jeff Taylor. I'm the president of Beeswax. We are a local manufacturer. Um, first thing I wanted to start, last year when we uh, passed the hemp bill, I don't know if everybody knows, but it, it, we did something right because Florida's following us. They're doing the same exact thing that we did here in Minnesota. So something was done right. But the reason I'm down here is um, two things. Uh, I just wanted to first off invite everybody from the Senate down, whoever wants to come down and see a manufacturing facility and see how everything is done, how it's operated. I had a lot of the people from the house down come by our facility and I just want you guys to know how the process actually works. And the reason for some of that is, is when we're doing timelines, because I, I don't know if everybody understands the timelines that we're up against. If, if we give licenses today, we're not gonna have anything out there for at least 12 months. So I'm glad that it's going over to the Office of Cannabis so we can get moving. Um, the Department of Health is, was given a tough job and they're doing a great job to be honest because I'm working with them uh, not on a daily basis but I see them on a regular basis. And um, the, the other thing that I wanted to uh, address, so there's an issue out there right now with flour, okay, which is a natural form of the plant they're not allowing that to be sold and they're taking it down, but we can sell all the altered gummies and all, everything else uh, that's altered, but we can't sell the natural form. I think that needs to be brought up somehow. We need to allow people to get it so it, they're, all they're doing is going to the illicit market and everybody knows there's fentanyl and there's other things in it. So I don't know how to address that. Maybe you guys do. Maybe they give it to people that are following the law and, 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 and selling out of, uh, that are licensed THC, uh, places right now. The only option you can get it right now is either going to the black market or driving three and a half hours away. And it's a, it's a product that's really wanted out there. Um, but again, I just wanted to invite everybody down to a facility so you can see how everything actually operates. If you would like to, um, feel free to reach out. Thank you for your time and you guys have a good day. Thank you for the information and the invite. Uh, Senator Port, before I open it up to questions, um, did you have any further comments? And it, it also sounds like there's still some ongoing ideas. Um, so I, I'm sure this is part of the overall continuing work in addition to, to making everything from last year flow smoothly. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Mitchell. I don't really have anything to add at this point. Um, would like to welcome the interim director back up, um, I think, uh, and open it up for questions. And I see her making her way down. Members, are there any questions? Senator. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it'd probably be just helpful to... Oh, Bruce, Senator Anderson's here. Awesome. So. <laughs> There's at least more Hello. than Hello. <laughs> With that, is there a question, Senator Coran? Yes, Madam Chair. And so, um, Senator Port, and I, I don't know who, if Ms. Briner wants to address it, in the, uh, in the A11 amendment, um, 
the local unit of government. So you basically strip the ability for local municipalities to be a primary applicant and, uh, and basically removing them if they so choose to have a municipality um, operate a, a cannabis dispensary. Um, it's problematic because of one, one, that we're in a business that you've mandated every municipality have these, but you also then have removed or restricted their ability to um, regulate and provide enforcement. So one of, the reason, one of the ways and the reason I'm sure that you're striking out or back at, at municipalities is that is one of the few areas where we could do that with staff, make sure we got legal product, that we could make sure and ensure only legal people provide it and provide that regulatory piece of the oversight on our own. And, and so you brought strange bedfellows, because I'm, I'm not a massive fan of municipal anything, um, especially liquor or otherwise. But, but when you strip the ability for, for those entities, um, traditional law enforcement, because you didn't follow all intoxicating substances laws and or tobacco laws, air quality, all of those things, um, you just made it more complicated and unnecessary. So yes, I'm sure you heard, that's why this is here that people were interested in doing that so they could actually do something and ensure that the product is, one, legal, and two, um, that we could apply the compliance at the point of sale. We've been stripped of those things. And so that's my first question. So is, is that a correct assumption? We've stripped them. If municipalities want it, I, I'm kind of curious how it works if there's excess licenses. What does that mean? How would that go for a municipality? Ms. Breiner? Or Senator Port. I, Ms. Breiner. Madam Chair, I, I actually think this is a question about the amendment, and so I yes. would defer to Senator Port to speak Senator to Port? the amendment. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Senator Cran. I'm not sure I'm understanding you correctly because I don't think that's at all what this amendment does. Um, this amendment clarifies, as we put in the bill last year, that municipalities can operate um, retail establishments, dispensaries, if you will. Um, this was done at the request of municipalities to allow them to um, sort of move to the front of the line after social equity applicants. Madam Chair. Senator Cran. Senator Port, so why would they be moved to, to, the, to the back of the line? Why would a municipality be able to have those as a part of their uh, of, of the requirements, planning and zoning. You're, you're forcing these upon uh, all municipalities because it's so good. Um, it looks like municipalities likely asked for the ability to do so, anticipating there are cities that want these and there are cities that want to ensure that they can control and manage from an oversight perspective from an enforcement. Um, so you basically said, yeah, we'll meet it, but then you move them to the end of the line but what does that mean if excess licenses? How, one, I, I'm, I know there's a number of 380 or something like that that's been tossed around, but what does it mean and when will excess licenses be available? I think it's clear, in my, one of my communities, they'd have to have five licenses within a county. Um, so you're saying once those five are issued to a s small segment of the population, then a municipality may or may not then acquire a cannabis dispensary license. Is that correct? Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so the way that this, that the process works for getting licenses is first there are licenses, temporary licenses, which then can become permanent licenses offered to qualifying social equity applicants. And then there's another lottery system, vetted, highly vetted lottery system for licenses to general applicants. That would have been the pool from which municipalities would have been in. And so we're moving them slightly up to have an opportunity at a license if they want one um, after those first social equity applicants receive them, but before the general lottery. So we're moving them up in the process. Madam Chair. Senator Coran. Thank you, Senator Port. And so I understand that. And so then um, if all 380 licenses then are issued to all social, equi social equity applicants, then there are no licenses left for the open free market. Is that correct? 
No, uh, Senator Madam, Madam Chair, Senator Coran, um, that is not correct. There's a certain number of licenses. I, I believe 50%, uh, Director Briner can confirm that, that are held for social equity applicants. The rest of the licenses are held in the general lottery. Madam Chair. Ms. Briner, can you answer that? Thank you, Senator, and thank you, Senator Port and Senator Coran. That is correct. So as we think about doing both the early license process and the regular, once rules are promulgated, license, we are dividing in half. There will be 50% for social equity applicants, 50% for general applicants, and then from that 50-50 split for the early licenses, 50% of the 50. So we're really talking about a limited number for early licenses, um, but we're also distributing equally. And so I believe that what Senator Port is trying to do as we're thinking about the distribution of licenses among all types of applicants is to give some sort of preferences to locals if they choose to enter this space. Madam Chair. Thank you for the clarification, Senator Coran. And Ms. Briner, so with the issuance of the, um, for the temporary license, when will you produce the rules which will define that exact criteria and have, has there been a, a state who's issued those same rules that passed a Supreme Court in this country? Ms. Briner. Because of its discriminatory practices. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Thank you, Senator Coran, for the question. Um, we are being, we're exercising as much due diligence as we can in the rulemaking process. Minnesota is very prescriptive about what that looks like, both for expedited rulemaking and traditional rulemaking. We are casting a wide net and we are doing, uh, consulting with experts, subject matter experts, looking at other states' rules, and we are trying to create a set of regulations that will withstand challenge and that will be easy for operators to understand and easy for regulators to enforce. Uh, we just got news yesterday that uh, New York uh, had its rules struck down uh, simply because of process. And so we also understand that doing this right, in addition to doing this in a timely way, is as important to the overall success of this endeavor. Thank you. Madam Chair. Senator Coran. Ms. Briner, so, so we had a conversation the other day, and I asked that question specifically, and it was a very different answer. And so I get the, the desire to dance around um, something that you're trying to stay out of the court system because you know it's a discriminatory practice to do what you want to do. I get that. Um, when will the rules be issued that you didn't answer? When will the, well, or, or maybe, maybe more simply, are you going to issue temporary licenses before you finalize the rules? Ms. Briner. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Chair Mitchell. Thank you, Senator. Um, I'll answer this first question uh, that you asked about when the rules will be in force. Our rules are uh, anticipated, and there's a timeline on our website. We anticipated promulgating the rules in early 2025. We also anticipate issuing early licenses under what we are proposing and opening for that process in summer of 2024. However, I want to be very explicit. Those early licenses do not allow people who are awarded those licenses to touch the plant because we do have a health and safety uh, and consumer safety concern. So we wouldn't want people operating without rules in force to make sure that we have those protections. Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Briner. Senator Coran. Ms. Briner, so you're going to issue licenses and go through the entire process for a select group of people. Um, and so do you anticipate those licenses being issued? Are those, are those who are getting those licenses, are they using their own private money for those licenses? Or what do you think the mix will be of those that will be state funded versus private sector? Ms. Briner. I'm not, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator. I'm not certain that I'm understanding what you mean by state funded. I would anticipate the social equity criteria is very specific in Chapter 342, and so those early licenses are designed to give an early mover advantage to that type of social equity applicant, and we will use that criteria to determine uh, eligibility for license, as well as the criteria for readiness that is specified. I, I'm not certain that I can anticipate what you mean by privately funded. Ma Madam Chair, I'll simplify my question. So, Senator Madam, Coran. Madam Chair, Ms. Brunier, so Briner, um, is it Briner or Brunier? It's Briner. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, 
in, in this process, you're gonna issue a license before the rules, and you know the rules are gonna end up ultimately put you in court. So you want to try and enable these businesses, many could be private using their own money, but I would assume based on the rest of the bill, the totality of the, the bill, those grants are gonna go to the social equity targets. So you will, you will likely spend state dollars to try and help enable them and build out facilities before the rules come out, or at least start the process. All of this is a very expensive process. When it's your own money, right, you get to do whatever you want, but they need certainty to be able to understand and be able to, before they can break ground. That's dispensaries, that's grow, all of these things combined. Will you be, will you be issuing grants to the social equity population prior to the completion of the rules and issuing temporary licenses as well? Ms. Briner. Madam Chair, Senator, uh, I believe you were talking about there are multiple grants in Chapter 342 and multiple agencies have responsibility. So the responsibility for uh, grants at the Office of Cannabis Management are for the Can Renew grants, which are the community reinvestment grants. Those won't go out the door until we're generating revenue from the cannabis uh, tax collections. There are also the Can Grow grants for cultivators in which we consult with the Department of Agriculture. And so, uh, we are in the process of working closely with the department, with DEED, which also has responsibility for some startup grants, and the name is escaping me right now. We're issuing an RFI to kind of get a picture of the landscape of appetite for what kind of assistance those grants will provide. I am not certain of the date that those grants will go out. I'm not certain that those will be in place so that they will be expended by the time we open for the early licenses in July. Thank Madam you, Ms. Chair, Breiner. Thank you, Ms. Senator Breiner. The, uh, but it, you guys are going to facilitate licensing, either t temporary granting licenses for people that, um, once you issue the rules, are going to be tied up in a court case. And I know you're trying to nuance the rules, otherwise you'd have them done already. Um, and so it puts our state money at great risk for any of the grants you plan to issue. You're describing it, well, that won't happen until revenue's coming in and we already have this thing up and running. Well, that can't happen until the rules are done. So you're, there's a whole, there's a, there's a time frame that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. And I get where you're trying to dance around the, the, the social equity piece because you know it's gonna end up in court. But private sector people that have this capabilities and the expertise are looking at where do I put my millions of dollars in the grow operations? Our communities are trying to figure out what does it mean for licensing um, throughout every aspect of this. And so we can plan for zoning and, and our, or our economic development um, to understand where we're gonna put these things. So um, unfortunately, it, it appears you are going to issue licenses before the rules. And I don't think anything should happen before the rules because you know it's gonna go to court. And so you're gonna put everything in great, in great harm's way and then the illicit market will continue to operate unfettered in Minnesota when the actual goal it was to put a viable, commercially, a safe, commercially viable product on the streets. So the growers have the same, same challenge, everybody does. When you're gonna apply social equity credit or the social equity piece to it with really no clarity, how does somebody understand, and there's gonna be many in that world that, that have all the financial wherewithal, um, which is great, but what you've described, there's no certainty because you know um, we're delaying it because we want to, uh, want to put a group of people in business prior to it going through the court system. And, you, and everybody knows it will be a huge challenge. And so that's, that's a huge risk to Minnesotans. So I'll leave that one alone. Um, I want to move on to uh, um, on another question from the social equity perspective. What about the 4,000 existing hemp CBD providers in the state of Minnesota? Are they all going to get a license? Ms. Briner. Thank you, Chair Mitchell. Thank you, Senator. Uh, our plan uh, in 342, we provide for, so 342 requires hemp operators, registered retailers, to apply for a license, and there is criteria for a license. We also realize we want to provide for continuity for those operators. As you said, there are more than 3,800 registered retailers across the, across the state, and so we uh, uh, provide a mechanism for conversion uh, to a full license, assuming they meet all of the required license criteria, uh, they must be registered with the state and they must be in good standing and meet all the licensing requirements, but we want to operate, uh, allow a bridge for them to continue operating until such time as OCM issues a license. 
Madam Thank Chair. Thank you, Ms. Briner. Senator Cran. Ms. Briner, so when you look at the, the 3,800 of them and 25% of them are not, don't meet the social equity criteria, what will you do with them? Ms. Briner. How will, how will you issue licenses or will you require or hopefully more people Senator Curran, could we do one question at a time, please? Ms. Briner. Thank you, Chair Mitchell. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Chapter 342 did not contemplate a specific number of hemp retailers, and Minnesota stands alone in the unique way in which we have legalized the hemp-derived uh, cannabinoid products. And so our assumption is that these retailers, assuming they are in good standing and meet the licensing criteria, will be given a license and continue to operate unless there is some reason for OCM to determine not to issue a license based on noncompliance with the law. Senator Coran. Madam Chair, Ms. Briner, so the social equity, social equity criteria may or may not apply then to that license? Ms. Briner. Madam Chair, Senator, that is correct. Okay. Thank you. I, I would Senator hope that holds true. So, um, Madam Chair, I, I, have, uh, I have another question. So okay. that the, and it follows in, into our jurisdiction as well for the rulemaking process. Um, I just have concerns about in section 32 the un, you know essentially moves into uh, allows an unlimited rulemaking it, you've already been in this has already been a year old, a year a year ago that this was passed or almost a year um, they're not happy about the unlimited rulemaking um, those are I think we should give you the rulemaking the ability to do that to implement it but then major rule, major changes should always come before the board um, the section 33 on the, uh, uh, within the bill, uh, the director, you're removing the director position from all of the existing kind of compensation categories. Where do you anticipate that, um, where do you anticipate that, that the director going and what will, what will drive the compensation determination for that position? Ms. Briner. Thank you, Chair Mitchell. Thank you, Senator. Uh, we would follow the direction of the Compensation Council uh, and recommendations that they make for similar agencies around compensation for those for those agency heads. Madam Thank Chair, Ms. Ms. Senator Coran. Ms. Briner, but that this group removes them from any other category, so they're they're not tied to it. They're not currently bound or governed by the Compensation Council. So, do you anticipate in the future that adding that position to the being governed by and being covered by the Compensation Council? And when do you anticipate that? Ms. Briner. Thank you, Chair Mitchell. Thank you, Senator. Um, we will follow the direction and the state processes for compensation. Uh, what we saw is that this is an agency regulating a billion, multi-billion dollar uh, industry. And our ability to recruit, uh, particularly for uh, regulatory expertise, both from within state government and externally, was hampered by the um, arbitrary cap on compensation, so we want to make sure that we have the ability to retain people with regulatory experience who will help us uh, maintain high standards. We thank will follow the direction of both MMB and the Compensation Council to make sure Ma that it is Madam Chair, and thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brenner. Brenner, Brenner. Um, yeah, I would agree. I, we want somebody competent um, that doesn't appear to always happen. I would love to pay them what they're truly worth, and I agree. We, the Compensation Council and the new hopefully we adopt the new structure um, or the guidelines that, that refine that. But that hasn't been the case, and you've seen the fiasco of them trying to fill the position that you occupy temporarily. Um, I'm not sure it was a salary issue um, and wasn't sure it was about how you're the most competent. So I would agree that we should have the most competent and pay them well. Um, let's see. Madam Chair, um, Senator with that, Cran. Um, one of the we have on, we guys, do have other people waiting to ask questions. If you want to go, okay, Senator Morrison. I know you've been waiting patiently. Thank you, Madam Chair. Whew. Uh, I, I want to uh, first just thank Senator Port for continuing to take on this very heavy and important lift, um, and special thanks to you, Acting Director Briner, for um, stepping in and really getting things off to a, such a strong start. Um, my question might be slight about, slightly out of our jurisdiction, but I think it's a quick one. Um, it's on page 76, um, Duties of Office of Can Cannabis Management, uh, on line 76.19, uh, the sentence starts that the, 
uh, the office may add or modify a qualifying medical condition upon the office's own initiative, upon a petition from a member of the public or from the Cannabis Advisory Council, or is directed by law. Um, I think it's the right thing to start this new Office of Cannabis Management, but I do have concerns that the Department of Health is no longer directly involved. And the, the medical evidence around cannabis is not tremendous. It's growing, and if we can remove it as a Schedule One drug, obviously on the federal level we'll be able to do much more compelling research. But I worry that, um, I don't want the public to think that it is a panacea for everything because one person had a good experience using it for X condition. So I just wonder if, if either you or the author can comment on why it's written the way it is. Ms. Breiner. Thank you, Senator, oh. and thank you, Senator Morrison. Um, if, if you would indulge us, we, I do have colleagues from the Office of Medical Cannabis uh, who developed the proposal who could speak to that and the way that we anticipate it being implemented. I also saw Senator Port. If uh, Senator Port, do you have any comment on that? Yes, I think uh, Director Briner's right that we should hear directly from uh, one of the folks from the office, but I think uh, an important piece is that the Office of Medical Cannabis is moving to the Office of Cannabis Management. Um, so those same experts will be overseeing it. They will just be working under the Office of Cannabis Management, if that makes sense. Thank you. And we have our um, additional testifier who has stepped forward. Could you please state your name and position for the record? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Um, my name is Caitlin Campbell. I'm a policy analyst for the Office of Medical Cannabis at the Department of Health. Um, the provision in 342 regarding the um, essentially a petitions process to add or uh, remove or modify qualifying medical conditions is actually mirrored in current statute for the Office of Medical Cannabis. We have a similar uh, petitions process now for allowable uh, delivery methods as well as uh, qualifying medical conditions. Um, every summer we take petitions in from the public um, and consider um, the uh, available scientific literature. We convene um, a medical cannabis review panel to help us um, uh, inform recommendations to the commissioner to add or uh, remove or modify those conditions. Uh, so this is simply uh, reflective of what is currently um, in statute uh, under health now and we'll just move over to OCM. Thank you. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick follow-up. Is there is there some level of evidence that's placed next to qualifying conditions, you know, in terms of the the level of, um, uh, you know, like A level evidence, B level evidence, it's just so the public is informed that the evidence may or may not be very compelling, whether or not you add um, a, a condition to the the list. Go ahead. Thank you, Senators. Um, uh, we have a very transparent process in terms of uh, what uh, literature is reviewed and considered. Um, the review panel's uh, meetings are also uh, open to the public, is my understanding. Um, in terms of the kind of designation of the different evidence bases in the literature, I would have to um, circle back with our research team um, and, and follow up outside of the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Did we have any further questions? Senator Curran. Oh. Madam Chair, um, in this question for Ms. Breiner is, uh, so when we talk about, because we kind of focused on the dispensary side, um, when do you anticipate that you will license um, the grow side? See, you're not gonna complete the rules so t sometime in 2025, maybe the second quarter, may not be. Um, it's a six to eight month, maybe a year process to, to decide where you're going to grow, acquire the millions of dollars in, in resources and, and the time. So when do you anticipate um, allowing the grow side um, so there's a, a market, so there's a product available that meets all of our criteria for the dispensaries that you appear to be attempting to license by the first of the year? So with the rules not coming out until after 2025, or, or in 2025, and the desire to issue dispensary licenses and get them temporary and get them rolling, um, when will the GROW operation um, 
start and when you anticipate the first license for a grow? Ms. Briner. Chairman Chill, Senator Curran, thank you for the question. Uh, chapter 342 has, is silent on staging cultivation to ramp up supply to meet demand. And so we are acutely aware that in order to uh, ensure a timely and successful launch, we need to think about staging. Um, I cannot answer that question today. We continue to have conversations and evaluate what the best way to do that. And we would welcome uh, input from uh, the authors, from members, about the best way to create mechanisms for us to ramp up sufficient supply to meet demand. Thank you. Madam Chair, so Ms. Brainer, so I understand you're serving in the temporary acting role, but you're the temporary acting director. And I assume there's a time frame for which you must build a significant grow operation before you can start to turn on any of the dispensaries. These things are expensive and time consuming to, to administer. So do you anticipate once the grow starts and whatever the sufficient volume would be necessary before you can even allow any dispensary to open? I mean, I. I I'm just looking at six, eight month lead time at a minimum to build and grow enough supply to even meet the minimum needs of the retailers which you plan to put into business. So is it you plan to have grow in place for a year prior to being able to, or, or at least start that li license that process a year prior to you turning on and allowing the dispensary licenses to be active? Ms. Briner. Thank you, Senators. Uh, we are in the process of getting ready to launch another of our surveys um, to actually get a sense of who will be in the universe of, particularly of cultivators, what type of license people will be applying for, including cultivators. Once we get a sense of that universe and what the leverage and readiness is, we'll have a better idea of how we can appropriately stage this. Thank you. Madam Chair, Ms. Bernier, we have, that's what you're, the expertise, you guys, that's your sole purpose since the existing or the beginning of this legislation. It shouldn't be that complicated to, to be able to tell us. We think it's going to be a year lead to build up a sufficient volume of capacity, build, right? I think we talked about a million and a half square feet to meet the need. Once you turn it on, those retailers are going to need a, a readily and you know, an accommodating supply chain um, of licensed facilities tested product and a retail operation that can deliver and meet the need. And so every, day, every time we don't get an answer on this, just to me, means to me the illicit market is really happy because they're just going to grow even larger than they are today. And so we should have that. that. It's been almost a year to be able to put those temporary timelines. You can ask any of the growers today. You guys have talked to everybody. And so if it takes a year, then you'll have to issue licenses very quickly or there's no need to issue the licenses for a dispensary. So I, I'm just frustrated that a time frame shouldn't be that complicated to put together to list when, when we have to have all of these things in place to open the doors and turn the switch on. Um, Madam Chair, with that, I'll move on to my, my, my last question. And, um, and so the, it's in the area, it's on, uh, on in section 33, I believe, yes. So I have a real challenge, not with the director's salary, we already talked about that, but um, Around the grants, and this particular uh, section covers, again, another state agency is going to go out and solicit and ask for grants and, and gifts and, and, and those types of things. Um, I first don't believe any government entity should be accepting gifts or anything. Um, if we decide we need to function, we fund those things in government. And then on the other side, you're also going to be making plenty of grants out to and including to for-profit, non-profit organizations. I still don't understand where a non-profit organization exists in a commercial retail market of what we're talking about in cannabis or hemp. But with that, um, I think we should also have specific and detailed reporting. So with that, Madam Chair, I'd like to move the A-12 amendment. The A-12 amendment has been offered. Senator Coran, could you please um, describe the A-12 amendment? Thank you, Madam Chair. The A-12, it, it, it basically just requires a report, the, um, report to the legislature on grants, gifts, uh, contributions, federal money that the director is now, al are now allowed to accept and report on the contracts and grants that the director is now allowed to enter into and award. Um, and those powers, as again, they're laid out in section 33, page 29. We want transparency on both sides, the acceptance, the solicitation and the acceptance of outside dollars to fund government operations, as well as uh, the issuance of the grant process on who the recipients are to ensure that they're, they're done. We've had a huge issue um, of government 
failing or not being transparent on the grant process. So this just basically creates a report to the legislature so we can have transparency. Um, I would request a uh, yes vote and also request a, a roll call. Thank you. A roll call has been requested. Senator Port, um, I know council is trying to email this to you. Is this an amendment you were previously aware of? And would you like me to read it or can we do anything to facilitate your response? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and uh, committee members. I've not seen this amendment. Um, I can imagine the gist of it. And, uh, you know, I will look at it as soon as I get it in an email. Um, but I also think that uh, much of this oversight is already done um, just in much of the uh, regulations that we passed last year. So um, I would defer to Interim Director Briner if she has a different take on it, but I, I would ask for a no vote on this amendment. Thank you. Um, Ms. Briner, would you like a copy of the amendment or were you given one? Thank you, Chair Mitchell. I have not seen the amendment. Could a pay, we have someone running it to you right now. And Senator Port, it should, I can't swear by email, but it should be in your email. Yes, Madam Chair, I see it now. Um, yeah, to me, this is redundant to work that we already do, um, that agencies are already required uh, to do, and so I would ask for a no vote. Thank you. Is there any further comment or discussion on the amendment? With that, can we please take the roll? Chair Mitchell. No. Chair Deedsick. No. Senator Anderson. Yes. Senator Barr. Mike is on. Aye. Senator Carlson. No. Senator Swadzinski. Nope. Senator Droskowski. Aye. Senator Fate. No. Senator Gustafson. No. Senator Jasinski. Aye. Senator Coran. Aye. Senator Lang. Senator McQuaid. No. Senator Morrison. No. Senator Lang is online. Aye. I don't know if that came across. Got it, thank you. There being six yes votes and eight no votes, the motion does not prevail. Senator Swazinski. Thank you, Madam Chair. I um, don't really have a question. I just want to thank um, the author and um, you, Ms. Briner, um, for coming forward today. I'm really impressed with how prepared um, your comments were to the inquiries put before you today, and so it's does not go unnoticed by me. I also want to remind everybody, um, nationally and statewide, that um, 91 years after the 21st Amendment, getting rid of prohibition, we're still debating liquor laws. And so for anybody to think we're going to get this right, right out of the gate, um, there'll be little catches and things to work on for the next 91 years, I'm sure, um, if the um, prohibition and current liquor laws are any indication. So anyways, thank Thank you for coming today. I appreciate it a lot. Thank you, Senator Swazinski. And seeing no further questions, Senator Swazinski moves at Senate Five. Yes, Senator Anderson. I had my hand up a while ago, but nobody saw it. I've been I've been looking left and right, Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Port, uh, in Section 41, you remove the ability to have oversight by the local uh, unit of government. I'm wondering why that is, why you've taken that, that out of the bill. Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, thank you, Senator Anderson. As was discussed earlier by Ms. Briner, uh, it moves the kind of enforcement that really 
um, is detail oriented and product specific and regulation specific to the Office of Cannabis Management who would have that kind of ability to both stay up to date on it and be specialized in that. It still leaves uh, the same enforcement uh, that localities have over something like a liquor store to make sure that they are carding for age appropriate, that they still have to meet the zoning regulations and things like that, that they're operating within the hours um, allowed, that it's, you know, any of the normal regulation um, of operating within the city ordinances. Um, it just moves that specialized kind of regulation that frankly the cities don't have the expertise for uh, up to OCM. And it also still allows for cities if they perceive or uh, suspect of some sort of wrongdoing to flag that for the OCM and pull a license temporarily or sort of put a hold on it until the OCM can come and investigate. So Madam Chair. Senator Anderson. Senator Port, the city of, city of whatever uh, jurisdiction will only have to, they will have to abide by what the OCM decides and not what they have jurisdiction over. If they have a moratorium on not allowing uh, marijuana or cannabis in their city or town, uh, o OCM has the deciding factor on that. Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Senator Mitchell and Senator Anderson. In our bill last year, uh, we do not allow for cities to uh, opt out of legalizing uh, the use of cannabis. Um, that is part of the structure of the bill that passed last year. Thank you, Senator Port. Senator Anderson. Madam Chair, I'd just like a roll call on this vote. A roll call has been requested. A roll call will be granted. Seeing no further questions, Senator Swazinski moves that Senate File 4782 as amended be recommended to pass and re referred to the Health and Human Services Committee. Please take the roll. Chair Mitchell? Yes. Chair Dietzik? Yes. Senator Anderson? No. Senator Barr? No. Senator Carlson? Yes. Senator Swazinski? Yep. Senator Dreskowski? No. Senator Fate? Yes. Senator Gustafson? Yes. Senator Jasinski? Yes. I'm sorry, no. Senator Coran? No. Senator Lang? No. And Senator McQuaid? Aye. Senator Morrison? Aye. Madam Chair, just on the motion, um, it was not um, referred as amended, just the technical issue. I did say amended. There being, there being eight yes votes and six no votes, the motion prevails. Um, Senate file 4782 is amended, has passed. It is now referred to the Health and Human Services Committee. Thank you all for your time and testimony. Thank you, Thank you Madam Chair. Senator Wickland, I see you waiting very, very patiently over there. If you could please step forward. Up next is Senate file 4861. When you are settled, if you could please um, begin your testimony. <laughs> And do you want your amendment right off the top, or do you want to explain um, the bill first? Well, uh, this bill, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this bill was heard in Health and Human Services, so I can talk about the bill, and then I can, um, I can discuss the reason for the amendment. Perfect. Um, this bill has um, language that is, there's kind of two components to it. Um, the main part of the bill, um, sections one and three, relate to a reporting uh, requirement that we developed and passed um, language last year in um, the HHS omnibus bill that 
is intended to bring some basic information about the 340B um, drug program to the public and Minnesota legislators. Um, this is an area that has been of interest to us to understand better um, how the 340B program um, is working and uh, the financial implications of it. Um, this is something that hasn't been done in um, many states or it's been discussed but not um, implemented report, reporting like this in many states and we would like to gain a better understanding of how that program is um, working in Minnesota. And so after, um, after session, the Department of Health worked on preparing for the first round of reporting. Um, that is underway and the first reports were due on April 1st of this year. Um, but they discovered that there were um, some needs for technical fixes to the address language um, that we passed last year. Um, there was feedback from stakeholders that um, helped, up, helped them develop um, the language that you see in the bill today. Um, so that is sections one and three. Section two um, is related to a different um, program, the Prescription Drug Transparency um, Act that we passed um, in a prior year. And it has to do with um, the uh, practices that the department needs to undertake to select drugs uh, for uh, a list that will be categorized as drugs of substantial public interest. Um, and it, uh, they found that there was some uh, missing language and that's why we included um, just the, the last um, two lines in that or three lines, four lines, in that um, section to capture what was needed for them to be able to implement um, the drug list of uh, drugs of public substantial interest. Um, what I would like to do with the amendment that uh, has been prepared is to remove the, the date. Um, when I uh, put, was working on the bill and when we created the language, um, we thought that this was a time limited uh, circumstance, but the way that this uh, creation of this list uh, will happen, it's a, a, pro a process that has to happen quarterly, and so uh, it isn't uh, feasible for rulemaking to be used um, as they develop the, the, this list. Um, it applies only to the subdivision, subdivision um, 10, and um, so I, that, that's what the amendment does. It just removes the date. Thank you, Senator Wickland. Um, with that explanation, Senator Gustafson moves the A3 amendment. All in favor of the A3 amendment, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. The amendment prevails. The amendment is adopted. A2. Yeah. A2. Uh, A2. I apologize. Well, that's not the right amendment. Oh. Okay. That's true. This is my, that was my error. Senator Gustafson moves the A2 amendment. Mm -hmm. All in favor of the A2 amendment, please say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Yeah. The amendment is adopted. Are there any questions on the bill as amended? Madam Chair. Senator Curran. So, Senator Wickland, on the, uh, I just have the question around the, kind of the reporting on lines 3.27, and, and 3.30 under the current law, it requires the commissioner to produce a, a, and post a list of the drugs of substantial public interest no later than January 31st of 2024. And on January 30, 30th, MDH sent out an email notice that it would release the list sometime in February. Are you aware if this has ever happened? Senator Wickland. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Coran, um, I do have, there is a testifier who, who can come forward and give the specific information. My understanding is that they have not released the, the list, but I will... Um, defer to the Department of Health so they can speak specifically to your question. Please state your name and affiliation for the record. 
Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Stefan Gildermeister. I direct the Health Economics Program in the Minnesota Department of Health, and it is our team. Madam that, Chair, could you speak into the microphone? Yep. And our team is is responsible for implementing the the. Um, various components of the Prescription Drug Price Transparency Act. And Madam Chair, to um, Senator Coran's question, uh, we have indeed not yet issued um, uh, the first list of uh, substantial public interest, uh, primarily uh, because we uh, are looking to get input on that first draft list. Um, so what, what is involved in identifying a list is uh, analysis, uh, expertise, public input, and uh, it is our plan uh, within a week or so to uh, uh, release a list, uh, give the public and the industry, uh, as well as other stakeholders, uh, the ability to comment on it and give us input on uh, uh, perspectives to consider as we continue developing these lists in a very dynamic and evolving um, uh, prescription drug market, and then issue a list, uh, the first list, by, I would say, late spring. Thank you. Madam Chair, and so um, once you issue the first one, do you anticipate then being able to meet the quarterly schedule, or does that also require industry input prior to continue, or, or to continue the, the quarterly process that was dictated in statute? Go ahead. Madam Chair, uh, Senator Coran, um, we think it's quite doable to uh, issue quarterly lists uh, once we sort of have a bit of experience under our belt, um, namely developing processes uh, that help us analyze data that we already collect, um, have effective and efficient processes for obtaining public input and processing it. So. Conducting the quarterly lists is quite possible. I, I, I think maybe to, to respond and take ownership uh, over the lateness of our first list, um, our prescription drug team is implementing uh, four independent initiatives to provide greater insight into uh, 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 pricing in the prescription drug market. And I think we've just been too optimistic in our expectation that we will, could do everything uh, by, by the January date required in statute. But I think by 2025, we'll hit that uh, quarterly uh, issuance uh, without much problem. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I, I appreciate it. Thank you. And then an uh, additional question on, on Section 2, lines 3.25 and 4 through 4.15. Uh, the new language exempts the commissioner from Chapter 14. Can somebody give us a business reason for that? Senator Wickland, or do you testify? I don't know if you have it's this part. I think, is that just the rule making? I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. I believe that references rulemaking. I don't if Miss James would Miss James would be able to give a specific Miss James, are you able to step in? Uh, Madam Chair and members, I can describe what the provision does, but I can't describe the business reason for yeah. it. If you could just describe what the provision does and then Miss James. Madam Chair and members, it exempts um, from rulemaking um, the agency's actions with regard to um, this list of these drugs of um, substantial public interest. They're oh. exempt both from full rulemaking and also from following the exempt rulemaking process. Senator Wicklin. Madam Chair, so Senator Curran, I think that that was related to the business part of this is related to the time it would take the dynamic nature of the drug market changing um, and that not fitting together. You know, rulemaking would take a six to nine month process if they were to do that. I mean, it wouldn't work with trying to develop a list of, a current list of drugs of substantial public interest to have that timeline um, applied to it. Does that answer your question? Ma Madam Chair and Senator, Senator Wickland, so the exemption from rulemaking is the exemption from the 
it doesn't prohibit them from rulemaking. In fact, it appears it allows it then to be unlimited rulemaking. But and the at least that's what it looks like with the and then also with the removal of the date of uh, in your amendment would appear then that they have the ability to or won't be encumbered or they would have the ability to make have unlimited rulemaking. Is that that's what I'm trying to figure out? Madam Chair, Senator Wicklin. Um Senator Grant, it's for this this particular subdivision only for subdivision ten. So that is the subdivision that deals with creation of the list. And yeah, if you want them to add. Please proceed. Could, do you mind stating your name for the record one more time? Of course. Madam Chair, uh, for the record, my name is Stefan Gildermeister, and, and I direct the Health Economics Program. <laughs> Apologize that I didn't speak up earlier. Um, to answer your question, Senator Koran, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't mention it uh, when we were talking about uh, the, the ability to do, uh, to, to con to issue quarterly lists. The very point of this amendment is sort of to recognize that rulemaking uh, uh, logistically is not compatible with issuing four lists uh, in, a, in a given year. So what, what the uh, provision uh, in the amendment, uh, in the uh, bill and in the amendment uh, recognizes, therefore, is that the commissioner has the responsibility to issue the list and uh, that that process is subject to what's in this, to the, to the criteria in the statute, but does not require rulemaking. Um, the, 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 the section of the bill, the section of the statute, 62J84, uh, contains a, a, a broader set of responsibility uh, responsibilities for the commissioner uh, related to prescription drug price transparency, data collection, uh, issuing annual reports, um, uh, uh, supporting um, uh, uh, analysis of uh, pricing in Minnesota. The rulemaking responsibility or the rulemaking, the permission to conduct rulemaking making for the broader uh, uh, um, law still remains in place. What the amendment, what the bill does, and the amendment clarifies is that the rulemaking uh, uh, does not apply to subdivision 10. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Wickland, for bringing this forward. This, to me, is a piece of this whole conundrum that we're trying to get at with drug price transparency. You know, my understanding is the 340B program started in the early 90s in response to rising drug prices um, to find a way to, in my view, give the pharmaceutical industry some cover um, to make them be the good guys in helping um, secure access to drugs for um, under, underserved communities in our country. It, it has come to be an important piece for different healthcare organizations for their survival. They've come to depend on it, but it's a very opaque part of the whole pharmaceutical <laughs> Uh, shill game in some ways, so it's really important that we, this is a part of gathering the data um, so that we can better understand it. Um, pharmaceutical companies charge what the market will bear, and it, it doesn't work perfectly uh, the way other market-based industries do when you talk about people's lives. Um, so I'm grateful for your work to add this to this big puzzle that we're trying to put together to better understand it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Morrison. Seeing no further questions, Senator Morrison moves that Senate File 4861, as amended, be recommended to pass and re-referred to the Commerce and Consumer Protection Committee. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. The motion prevails and Senate File 4861, as amended, is on its way to the Commerce and Consumer Protection Committee. Thank you, Senator Wickland, although you are staying in place because we also have Senate File 4874. When you are ready, please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senate File 4874 relates to um, some cybersecurity reporting um, that we would like to put in place. And um, Madam Chair, I do have an author's amendment for this bill, the A3 amendment which I would appreciate if we could adopt. 
Thank you. This is the first stop for this bill. And Senator Carlson offers the A3 amendment. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The amendment is adopted. Please proceed with your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, with today, we, we all have seen, I'm sure, uh, many reports of cyber attacks that are increasingly um, targeting, you know, not only industry sectors, but also targeting political subdivisions and schools. Uh, we believe that Minnesota would benefit from an improved information sharing process. Um, currently, we have federal partners, um, in, in, and we do receive information from them. Um, they share information to the state, and then uh, we distribute that to political subdivisions. Um, the threat level, threat alerts that they provide are helpful, but sometimes they may not have information about active attacks um, at the local level. By reporting current attacks or attempted attacks to the state, um, our organization Minute uh, will be able to share information about threat vectors uh, with others who may be impacted. Um, the intention is that we, the reporting would only share what is being attacked um, and how, um, not who is being attacked. Um, and each year, um, as a result of this legislation, uh, Minute would compile data on attacks to share with the Legislative Commission on Cybersecurity and to enable the state, the legislature, and political subdivisions to have better data and be better informed about what types of resources are needed to best position um, the state to protect Minnesotans. Um, similar legislation has passed in 10 other states that include states such as North Dakota, Texas, Georgia, Florida, um, Indiana, New Jersey, um, and so on. Um, and over the past several years, Minute has intentionally focused on increasing um, engagement and partnership with local governments and schools, um, notably with the establishment of the Minnesota Cybersecurity Task Force in 2022. Um, that task force includes members from local governments, from tribal nations, and private security, um, cybersecurity experts, along with uh, folks from Minute. Um, and uh, so this bill would not uh, be needed to, I mean, we will continue collaboration amongst all these entities, uh, but it will help us gather more information and make the engagement more effective. Uh, by providing the de decision makers with better data and information on the types of attacks uh, that are impacting Minnesota. Uh, briefly, just to highlight the sections of the bill, um, there's a defin definitions section um, that includes some of the terminology that is used later in the bill. And then uh, there is a section that requires reporting. Um, this would require local governments and schools to report cybersecurity threats. Um, and um, in conversation with MDE and impacted organizations, charter schools, intermediate and cooperative schools were added to the list of reporting entities. Um, these reporting requir requirements would begin in December of 2024. Um, there's a timeline for reporting incidents um, of 72 hours uh, within 72 hours of detection, uh, but there is no penalty for not reporting. Uh, by, dis by, excuse me, September 30th of this year, Minute and the BCA will post instructions on reporting, including an FAQ to be developed jointly with reporting entities. Um, and also by the end of September, they will make a reporting tool available. Um, there's language about the privacy of reports, and a subdivision on a report to the legislature that will be uh, delivered starting in 2026, so one full year after implementation, um, to provide the Legislative Commission on Cybersecurity with a report that provides information on the number and type of threat reports received and types of entities um, reporting, but not specific names of those re submitting reports. Uh, work to develop this bill occurred uh, with a lot of uh, stakeholder outreach. Uh, there was outreach to public schools, 
um, via Minnesota School Board Association. Uh, there was outreach to the Minnesota State University system. Um, also to cities and counties. And um, you'll see there was a, a letter of support in your packets from the from AMC and from the Minnesota um, County IT um, organization. Um, so that is at a high level that that is what the bill is intended to do. And I have uh, a couple testifiers who can talk about the need and, and what the reporting would help us with. So. Th thank you so much. Um, Ms. Mr. Israel? Correct. Okay. Um, and we still have a number of agenda items today, and I actually think Senator Wickland did a very good, comprehensive job. So if you could be concise, that would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Senator Mitchell and, uh, and members. Appreciate that. For the record, my name is John Israel. I'm Assistant Commissioner for uh, Minnesota IT Services and the Chief Information Security Officer for the state. Uh, this, this bill, uh, Senator Wickland did a, did a great job of highlighting the, the kind of the key factors. Really, this is, this is basics uh, to help us build on uh, informal relationships that we've built over the years through uh, programs that have helped support local governments, help support cities, counties, and others in cybersecurity, uh, and help sharing information. So this will help bridge and build on that capacity in a more formal manner. Really, this the, the, we're looking forward to, to in, encouraging the passage of this bill uh, to, to clarify those details of who, when, why, where to report, and at the same time protecting those entities so they don't become recurring victims uh, based on the information getting out and, uh, too, uh, too quickly into the public, uh, to the public realm. So uh, really formalizing processes, uh, bringing back intel, and sharing that very quickly. I'm glad to discuss more, but I'll keep it concise for your purposes. I greatly appreciate that. And Mr. Simmons or Simons? If you could state your name and affiliation for the record. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I am Eric Simmons. I'm the Director of Technology Services for the Chisago Lakes School District. Uh, so I'm here representing not only Chisago Lakes schools, but also the uh, Minnesota Association of School Administrators and uh, K-12 technology leaders as a whole across the state, uh, advocating in favor of SF4874. Uh, the landscape of Minnesota's public education system is vast and intricate, serving over 870,000 students and employing over 126,000 individuals, each with digital records. These numbers reflect a significant portion of our state's population, highlighting the vast amount of digital information within public schools to ensure education services. However, behind those statistics lies a really complex web of 331 individual public school districts, each with its own unique challenges. So whether overseeing a district of 1,000 students or a smaller one with only a few hundred students, the commitment to ensuring the security of our digital resources and information remains unwavering. Uh, it's essential to acknowledge the glaring discrepancy in available resources from districts with minimal staff who wear many hats within their positions, like uh, the district I serve in Chisago Lakes, uh, to larger districts with more extensive teams dedicated to cybersecurity. Uh, the escalating threat of cyber events in K-12 cannot be ignored. Uh, as of this school year, 44% of educational institutions nationally have been targeted by ransomware, costing millions to rectify successful attacks. The aftermath of such attacks extends far beyond financial implications, disrupting vital services and impeding the educational process and underscores the urgency for bolstering our cybersecurity measures. I see this legislation as progress towards three critical areas requiring attention. Uh, the first is the need for statewide K-12 leadership, technology leadership specifically, um, adequate human and financial resources, and coordinated and timely communication. Our interconnectedness means that when one district faces a threat, others in the vicinity are, are often targeted as well. I think last year's incidents in Minnesota and Iowa exemplify this reality where swift action was imperative. Uh, the situation in Minnesota left many K-12 leaders scrambling due to a lack of information. So SF4874 represents a pivotal step towards establishing a unified front against cyber threats and facilitates partnerships between public agencies to be more efficient in our responses. By fostering partnerships between K-12 entities and other public sector stakeholders, this bill facilitates the dissemination of real-time threat information and a deeper understanding of our threat landscape, empowering technology leaders to proactively mitigate risks. I commend MNIT and the bill's author for their collaboration 
with K-12 leaders in crafting a solution that aligns with our needs. Um, in closing, I urge your support for SF-4874, recognizing its potential to enhance the cybersecurity resilience of our public schools and safeguard the future of Minnesota's education system. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Seeing no questions. Oh, sorry, Madam oh, Chair. Okay. Uh, Senator Curran. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Senator Wicklin, Commissioner Israel, Mr. Simmons from the great uh, county of Chisago and Chisago Lake Schools. But, uh, and thank you for bringing it forward because this is critical, and we've done great work in the Blue Ribbon Council, Tactical Advisory Council, and this is a result, members, of, of what is the global leadership that we bring, not only protect the Minnesota state assets, but every level of government from within. And so thank you, Senator Wicklin, and uh, I'm glad to get to vote yes on it. Thank you. Given that glowing, Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just uh, in the uh, uh, amendment, it, it erases the effective date, and I'm just wondering, uh, maybe Ms. James can give us an idea what that effective date will be then for this bill. Ms. James. Madam Chair and members, if the bill were to travel on its own with no fiscal appropriation in it, it would be effective August 1st. If it is included in an omnibus with an appropriation, then it would be July 1st. Thank, thank you. Seeing no further questions and giving seven, Senator Coran's glowing review, um, Senator Coran moves that Senate file 4861 as amended be recommended to pass and re ref I'm sorry, 4874, uh, be recommended to pass. Okay. Um, as amended, be recommended to pass and re referred to the Judiciary and Public Safety Committee. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, aye. nay. The um, Senate file 4861, as amended, passes. It is on its way to Judiciary and Public Safety. Thank you, Senator Wicklin. Thank you very much, committee. Up next will be Senate File 4892, Senator Gustafson. As Senator Gustafson makes her way forward, just a friendly reminder, we have gotten through three items in an hour and a half. Um, we have set up seven items left to go. So if testifiers could continue to be brief and questions could continue to be concise, that would be lovely. Senator Gustafson, uh, Senate file 4892 at your convenience. Thank you, Madam Chair. SF4892 updates the powers and duties of the Department of Information Technologies, or MINIT, to reflect the current practices of the department. MINIT's enabling statute, Chapter 16E, was enacted in the late 1990s and reflects the internet practices of that time. This is pre-Y2K we are talking about, so this needs an update. 4892 would remove the conflicts between the existing law and current practices to allow MINIT to move more effectively to deliver digital services. Updates include adding initiatives to the duties of MINUT to reflect modern ways of delivering services, requiring MINUT to monitor all projects, not just those over the $5 million threshold, which is already current practice, and requiring the inclusion of more information about ongoing projects in MINUT's January 15th report. It proposes simple changes to the existing laws regarding MINUT's duties that will allow MINUT to continue its operations without being in conflict with the duties that were created when the internet was just getting started. Uh, I have a testifier whenever you're ready, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, Mr. Hirsch. Chair Mitchell, members, thank you. Thank you, Senator Gustafson. Um, Senator Gustafson provided a, a great overview of this statute. Um, minutes enabling statute is, has evolved over time as minutes relationship with our state agency business partners continues to evolve. As Senator Gustafson mentioned, uh, the statute contains a number of outdated provisions that reflect uh, antiquated technology practices uh, as in, in the industry as well as how MINUT operates today. In, a, in the whole, this bill seeks to align current business practices to the way that MINUT works with our business partners and remove some of these older sections of statute that uh, existed pre-consolidation. Uh, I'm happy to provide a, a brief walkthrough of, of sections and, and edits, um, or, or happy to pause for questions at the chair's discretion. 
Uh, Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, on page six, section eight, it changes the word from shall to may. I'm wondering, is there things that we don't have to do anymore and you, if you only want to, you can or you don't have to? I'm just wondering why that change in the, the statute. Mr. Hirsch. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Senator Anderson, which line is that are you referencing? 6.25. 6 Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Senator Anderson. Uh, this change reflects the, the practice of evolution of architectures across agencies. Uh, so the, the May here provides the opportunity for agencies to develop architectures that are best fit for their own practices. Well, Madam Chair. Senator Anderson. What's wrong with the things that you're doing now? Mr. Hirsch. Uh, this allows the agencies and Minute to better evolve to uh, changes in, in the technology industry nationally. So, Madam Chair, Mr. Hirsch, you're, you're still going to be doing things, and it should, it should be a shell that you're going to do things even though you might be changing them. That's correct. Yep. It provides for greater flexibility in the information architecture space. Uh, Madam Chair. Senator Anderson. Thank you. On page 7, that uh, you're changing the uh, on 7.30, an estimated cost uh, from five million to ten million. Yeah. Mr. Hirsch. Thank you, Chair Mitchell, Senator Anderson. This uh, this section of statute uh, ex was first introduced. Let me just get my number here. Uh, this, this section of statute, including this cost threshold, was introduced over 20 years ago. Um, so as uh, technology costs have grown, as, as project efforts have evolved, uh, we're proposing the increase in that threshold uh, to just allow for the, the largest and most complex projects to fall into these thresholds. But I would note elsewhere in statute, um, we actually make a change to reduce the threshold for which all IT projects are monitored, um, provided that we current business practice is that Minute monitors and approves all information technology projects, uh, and current law sets a threshold for that. So this creates an opportunity for us in statute to monitor all projects, but increases the threshold for um, for the risk assessment and mitigation and the external monitoring just to those projects that are largest and most complex. Well, Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator Anderson. Thank you. Uh, in Section 11, we're doing a repealer. And I'm wondering why all these statutes are being done away with. Are, are, are they not good? Uh, Mr. Hirsch. Chair Mitchell, Senator Anderson, uh, these repealers really relate to the, the evolution of Minute post-consolidation. Um, the, it, they are a mix of um, reports um, that we are proposing to repeal. We're, Minute is always happy to provide reports to the legislature. We have a comprehensive project portfolio report that we publish every January. Uh, last year, we worked with uh, House leadership to add a report on cloud computing uh, to align to sort of the salient issue of, of the day. So we're proposing here that, you know, as we add more high value reports, uh, that we look to reduce the reports that are, provide less value to, to legislators. Um, those, those hit the first two um, repealers here. The, sec or the third repealer of 16E0465, that really relates to minutes evolution after consolidation. So this section of statute required the commissioner of Minnesota IT services to approve projects that were conducted at agencies before minute staff were the ones carrying out those projects. So it was an important mechanism before those staff worked for minute because it served as a check on initiatives and projects underway at agencies um, that they aligned with minute policies and procedures. Because those staff are now consolidated and all work for minute, work for us, they're part of our agency, um, this mechanism is, is impractical um, and is, is not one that we can carry out as the, the statute has. So. 
Uh, and then the, the following two repealers, 16E55 and, and dot 20, um, really relate to that sort of pre-Y2K internet era and are, are, are fine as they exist in statute, um, but are fairly impractical and, and don't really align with the way that we work with our business partners today. So. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Coran. Thank you, Madam Chair. And you might want to mark this on your calendar. So we get two bills that I get to uh, vote for today. So I'm, I'm uh, thanks, Senator Gustafson and, and uh, Mr. I, Hirsch. Um, yeah, this is a, a result, 20-year-old legislative, when we had a common state portal and, and the migration of all technology, in addition to the consolidation of what we used to ha operate over the last 20 years, consolidating pretty much just to a few stragglers out there um, from a data center perspective. So um, thank you for bringing it forward, and I'm encouraged, and, and I'm glad we'll be voting yes on this one. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Cran, I am so sorry to disappoint you. Um, seeing no further questions, this is being laid over. There will not be a vote. Thank you. It is laid over for possible inclusion. Sorry. Up next will be Senate File 4788. Senator Hur, if you could please step forward. And Senator Hur, at your convenience. And again, I'm just respectfully asking everyone: the more concise they can be, the the better. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Um, Thank you, uh, Chair Mitchell, and also Chair uh, Deeset of this committee and members. Uh, I'm here to present Senate 54788, the City of St. Paul Franchise Fees uh, Rate Limitation Repealed. The 1979 statute put limitation on the City of St. Paul Franchise Fee Structure that only apply to the City of St. Paul and no longer makes sense in today's context. The statute prohibits the city from charging residential customer franchise fee on electricity and gas usage from November to April. Because electricity usage peaks in the summer and gas usage peaks in the winter, the impact is that residents pay higher fees on this electricity use than on their gas use. This sends precisely the wrong market signal from a climate perspective. With electricity getting cleaner and down to net zero should be for 2040. This bill, um, this bill would repeal the 1979 statute, allow the city of St. Paul to move into talks with Excel for the franchise agreement renewal with more flexibility for creating a fair fee structure that avoids sending negative market signal from a climate action perspective. So I have with me Mr. Ross Start, Chief Resilient Officer for City of St. Paul to testify and also answer any questions that members may have. Thank you, Senator Herb. Mr. Stark, if you could please state your name again for the record and proceed. Uh, Madam Chair and members, thank you. My name is Russ Stark, Chief Resilience Officer for the City of St. Paul. And uh, Senator Herr really covered the issue quite well. Um, I would just add that we're, we're just looking to have the same kind of opportunities as all other cities. We're not sure of the origin of this 1979 statute that only applied to the City of St. Paul. Um, but it is, it is now an obstacle to what we think would be a, a, a fair fee structure going into our negotiations with Excel, which would be for 2026. And Excel has um, said that they're staying neutral on this bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Senator Cran. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Senator. Um, I assume this is gonna help you lower the cost of living in St. Paul and the utility rates in St. Paul or reduce the taxes? Mr. Stark? Stark can answer that. Um, the, the idea here is that right now, people get on their, on their bill um, a line item that says city fee in some months and not others. At the very least, what this will be able to do is to, to spread the, uh, that fee out over the course of the year and again to equalize uh, between 
gas and electricity. We don't have any specific intention to raise more revenue. We're trying to, um, we're trying to uh, make the fee structure more fair. But we'll be going into those negotiations with Excel um, in the future. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Coran. Seeing no further questions or comments, Senate File 4788 is laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Senator McEwen. If you could please come forward and we will be presenting Senate File 4597. Um, if testifiers Holcomb and Edinger could please be readily on deck. Proceed to Senator McEwen. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, members, I'm very pleased today to be able to bring Senate File 4597 before you uh, for your consideration. Madam Chair, um, as I um, begin my introduction, I, I do have an A1 amendment. I'm wondering if I could address that first so that the bill is in order. Please do. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and um, I know that counsel uh, for the committee has helped us with some language pieces. These are generally clarifications and um, making sure that the language that's used in the statute conforms with drafting protocols and, and whatnot. Um, if um, Ms. James would like to go through any of them to provide some more context, that could be helpful, but in general, my my the summing up of it is that it is sort of a making sure that the language is appropriate and reflects appropriately what we want to do and say. Thank you for that explanation. Uh, seeing nothing further on the amendment, um, Senator Carlson moves the A1 amendment. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Opposed, nay. Okay, the, append the amendment is adopted. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as the committee with jurisdiction over PELRA, or the Pl Public Employee Labor Relations Act, you all know its core purpose, to provide fair rules by which public employees may decide to form unions according to their communities of interest. I bring this bill before you because in this regard, PELRA has failed over 23,000 employees at our state's premier institution of public higher inst education. The current statute denies them the right to unionize with workers who perform the same or similar jobs. The core issue this legislation addresses is the use of mandated bargaining unit, units that, to be frank, have gerrymandered the U of M workforce into unorganizable units. Mandated bargaining units are the exception. They are not the norm. While some U of M workers have found appropriate unions in their mandated bargaining units, over two-thirds of the University of Minnesota workforce is trapped in units that make no sense and effectively prevent collective bargaining. Nowhere else will you find such head-scratching bargaining units, not in the public or the private sector. On this matter, I would refer the committee to the expert written testimony provided by Professors William Jones and Charlotte Garden, specialists in labor law and history. And as long as I'm um, speaking to that, members, you should have before you a packet of letters of support uh, of many, many letters of support from various uh, labor unions, um, students, professors, experts. Um, this is widely recognized as a problem that has been in existence and getting worse for a number of years, and the coalition around making these changes is large, and hopefully your, your packet of information will help you to be able to, to gauge that. PELRA has rules and, and institutions for handling unit determination. They work perfectly well. It's time to put them to work to fix this mess. This bill would also allow student and graduate student workers to gain union protections that they currently lose and regain depending on the funding source for their employment. 
So I want to make sure people understand that because we've heard excellent testimony in past committee about this. There are student workers who may be able to join a bargain un bargaining unit or not, so have the union protections they wish to have or not, depending on the funding source for their employment. So depending on whether they, how they're being funded in their work. Student workers who are fortunate enough not to need financial aid or work study programs can join unions. However, student workers who need these programs are barred from joining unions. The bill addresses this fundamental inequity whereby working and middle class students have fewer labor rights than their peers. Years. As my House co-author, Representative Sidney Jordan, recently deftly remarked, your right to join a union should not hinge on how much money your parents made last year. That is the current state of the Pellera legislation, or the Pellera law. This bill is urgently needed. As I noted, it's been a long time coming. In just a few weeks, over 2,000 U of M employees have signed a petition urging the immediate passage of this bill. You should also have a copy of that in your packets. I invite you to read, again, the letters of written testimony submitted by U of M educators, medical residents, librarians, researchers, IT professionals, administrative staff, graduate fellows, and student workers to hear directly from them why action must be taken now. Hardworking public employees should never be told that their fundamental labor rights must wait. I urge you to pass this bill on so that U of M workers may have the same rights to choose together with co-workers and join together with them if they decide in unions as anyone else. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Our first testifier on the list is Ms. Holcomb. Uh, if you could please proceed. State your name for the record. Yes, thank you. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair and Committee. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify in favor of SF4597. Um, I'm especially glad to be able to speak about this issue in front of my senator, Kelly Morrison. My name is Heather Holcomb. I'm a lecturer um, in English at the university. I'm also the vice president of the University of Minnesota chapter of the American Association of University Professors. I've been teaching at the U for six years. I'm here today because in its current form, PELRA does active harm to thousands of workers at the U. I am one of them. I hold a PhD in my field, and I teach hundreds of students each year with distinction. It is the joy of my life to do this work. Yet because of PELRA's mandated bargaining units, I am classified as staff rather than faculty, and my job is defined by precarity. I work on last minute, unstable, short-term contracts for unlivable pay. Last year, I earned $38,000 as a full-time instructor at the University of Minnesota teaching three classes per term to over 350 students. For most of my time at the U, I have received no benefits of any kind. There are over 1,500 contingent faculty like me at the university, and we are part of a broad coalition asking for our basic right as Minnesota public employees to form common sense bargaining units. PELRA currently denies U of M workers that right. Worse, it warehouses us in illogical and impossibly large units that block paths to unionization. To explain, I'd like to direct you to the document in your uh, materials called Bargaining Unit 11. Please do take a moment and locate it. It is a two-sided document that looks like this. Madam Chair. Senator Anderson. Could you speak a little bit more into the microphone? Yes, I can. Is Thank that better? You. Thank you. Yeah, all right. Uh, could you look in your packet to find this statement? Um, it's a document called Bargaining Unit 11. Um, and once you've got it, Yes, Thank please you. proceed. Yeah, Please continue. You. Sure. Um, this is my bargaining unit. Uh, this is the result of the current statutory requirements under PELRA. I'd like you to look carefully. I do note that it is two-sided, and yes, it is difficult to read. And that is because Unit 11 consists of more than 5,600 workers in no fewer than 199 job categories. To have a union, I would need to organize thousands of HR, IT, marketing, research, and student services staff. I would also need to organize the director of athletics, who makes over $1 million a year. 
One group you will not find in Unit 11 are the tenure track faculty who teach down the hall from me. They are in Unit 8. We do the same work, yet we are prohibited from bargaining together. Units 11 and 12 are both absurdly bloated, even as union represented units are whittled away through the manipulation of job codes. In total, Pell relieves 23,000 Unit of M employees with no plausible path to unionization. These statutory bargaining units are anomalous. They are unnecessary and they are unjust. They are out of step with peer institutions around the country. They are needless. As was noted, Pelra already has rules for determining appropriate bargaining units. And frankly, they enable the exploitation of educators like me. We and our students deserve better than this. Only the legislature can correct this injustice. It is a statute. I urge you to take this action on behalf of over 2,000 University of Minnesota employees who have signed a petition supporting this bill. Together, we do the good, hard work of making our university extraordinary every day. We are here as your constituents asking you to restore our most basic right as Minnesota public employees, the right to decide for ourselves whether to form and join unions that truly represent our interests and our experiences. And I thank you deeply for your time today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Holcomb. Um, as you, for your testimony, um, before we get to the president, if Mr. Ringenberg could please step into this seat so we can just keep moving. And Mr. President, if you could please state your name, title, and then proceed. Very good. Good afternoon, Vice Chair Mitchell, uh, Chair Dietzik, and members of the committee. I am Jeff Ettinger. I'm the interim president at the University of Minnesota. And I thank you for the opportunity to speak about SF4597, a bill to modify the public employee definition at the University of Minnesota. The university continues to gather data in order to address the requested fiscal note, and we also want to consider other operational implications to the university. The University of Minnesota actively supports a positive and respectful work environment for all of our employees, both bargaining unit and non-bargaining unit faculty, staff, and students. Whether through collective bargaining or our shared governance structure, we enjoy multiple connections with all of our employees to regularly seek feedback on issues of importance. Let me be clear, the university does not wish to prevent employee groups from organizing. In fact, the university agrees that a review of Pelra is due given changes to the overall work environment and the needs of the university over the past 40 years. However, any changes to Pelra must ensure that the university's workforce is still able to fulfill our mission of teaching, research, and outreach. We feel the best way to move forward is for the university administration to work in close collaboration with the employees and shared governance partners who would be impacted by any changes. In fact, this is exactly the same way it was successfully done in 1980 to create the statutorily defined bargaining units we have now. The challenge we see with the proposed bill as it is written, as well as the pace of the bill in the current session, is that it has the potential to lead to unnecessary complexity, conflict, litigation, and administrative burden. For example, while we agree that units such as the current PNA grouping is unduly large and cumbersome, the bill proposes no limit at all as to how small or numerous future bargaining units might be. We currently bargain with 11 units in the University of Minnesota system. This could prompt five new ones, it could prompt 10 new ones, it could prompt 50 new ones. In addition, the bill opens the door to the inclusion of undergraduate students on work study, as well as student athletes. A discussion on this latter issue has barely begun on a national level, yet the proposed new Pelra would open the door to this in the state of Minnesota. The bottom line is this, while we are open to amending Pelra after 40 years, we feel the right way to undertake this process at the university is to involve others, including those in consultative government. Like many initiatives at this university, the process would take more than the few weeks left in this session to evaluate what this bill might mean for the future. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for your testimony. Um, if Ms. Frakes could please come on deck and Mr. Ringenberg, hopefully I'm saying that correctly, if you could proceed and state your name for the record. You did admirably, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Senators, my name is Ian Ringenberg. 
Uh, as a proud constituent of Senator Dijiks, I'm particularly grateful for this opportunity to speak on behalf of the thousands of University of Minnesota employees who support this bill. For the past 11 years, I've worked at the University of Minnesota, first as an academic advisor, and for the past three years as Associate Director of Curriculum and Outreach in the University Honors Program. I've also been an active participant and leader in campus governance and staff senate. In 2018 and 2019, I served as the chair of the elected PNA representative body on campus. In 2015, I joined a group of other employees, including staff and faculty, who wanted to form a union at the University of Minnesota. We sought to organize along common sense bodies of shared interest and experience. Those who teach, research, and direct the academic life of the university would be in one unit. The staff who support the university's core mission would be in a second unit. Had we been employed anywhere else, I believe we would have won those unions. But because we work at the University of Minnesota, Pelra blocked our path to collective bargaining. I testified in front of the Bureau of Mediation Services at that time regarding the same issues you have before you today. That the 6,500 workers lumped together as Unit 11 professional and academic employees share no common community of interest and in many cases are barred from organizing with workers who perform similar jobs. And the Bureau of Mediation Services agreed with us. Had their initial ruling held, we might not be here today. Unfortunately, the university administration chose to appeal their decision and the appellate court ruled that BMS lacked the authority to fix these nonsensical bargaining units. The, the appellate ruling was clear. That authority lies solely with the legislature in your power to amend PELRA. We cannot address our current bargaining unit definitions through resolutions by our campus senates, which are purely consultative, or even through the BMS. SF 4597 offers a common sense solution. The University of Minnesota should play by the same unionization rules as other public employers. It gives all UMN employees the opportunity to unionize with those similar, in similar jobs or not if they don't want to collectively bargain. I believe these basic rights are consistent with the values of most Minnesotans and of my University of Minnesota community. Eight years after I first testified before the BMS about the extraordinary barriers to collective bargaining and PELRA, I ask you to support SF4597 and finally solve this decades old problem and restore full labor rights at the University of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Ms. Frakes, if you could please state your name for the record and proceed. Yes, you can hear me okay? All right. Um, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Whitney Taha Frakes. I am the chair of the Professional and Administrative Consultative Committee, committee and Senate. The Professional and Administrative Senate which from now on I'm gonna say PNA, because that's much easier, um, is a body of 97 employees representing 7,494 individuals across all five campuses and University of Minnesota Extension. When I accepted the role as a chair, I told the members on May 5th, 2023, that one of my intentions during this year would be con to convey the breadth of PNA insights to leadership, leveraging nuance and variety. My testimony will be a wholehearted attempt to live into that sentiment. In front of you is an infographic. It was handed to you right before you started hearing testifiers. Um, this was created to help others who aren't um, in, ingrained in the university understand the PNA employee class. And in fact, it, you don't actually have to be outside the university. It's confusing for those that are in the university too. Um, so you may have learned from prior testimony, even testimony today, that there is a large um, constituency that contains individuals who do very different and important work um, that is vital to the mission of the university within the PNA employee class. Uh, during a working luncheon with Board of Regents members last October, I shared concerns that the PNA classification has been used beyond its intended purpose. During its December meeting, I conveyed to the Board of Regents that there are major concerns among PNA constituency that will impact the quality of our mission delivery if not addressed. 
The perceived benefits of working for the university have diminished in the eyes of many. Uh, new solutions need to be leveraged to retain and support the work of our research fellows, librarians, program and unit communicators, directors of degree programs, directors of admission, academic advisors, extension regional education, educators, specialists, teaching faculty, lecturers, and teaching specialists. The titles matter too. If you ask a teaching specialist, they'll say they're a teaching specialist. If you ask somebody if they're a lecturer, they, they say they're a lecturer. So I want to make sure titles also matter. And that's not an exhaustive list. So it does not come as a surprise that when I asked, many PNA employees have written to me in a passionate support of power reform. Some of the reasons employees want to see power change is because, as one person said, Working conditions are tenuous and unionization could provide a path to fairer and more stable working conditions. A research professional shared, salaries for those of us without union representation have fallen dramatically behind those who are represented. That, and these are examples of individuals that work together. One College of Liberal Arts department member shared that they could not hire a candidate for a PNA teaching position because the salary being offered was not a livable wage. Many are uncomfortable to be on an unprotected contract that is, renew is, is renewed year by year. Um, and lastly, an extension employee shared that they lose individuals to other parts of the state system because those employers um, offer salary compensation packages that are more in line with the years of experience and qualifications. So employees are excited and hopeful at the prospect of the ability to organize. If passed, I do want to make sure that the new law doesn't impose new artificial units that will further frustrate. So I want to just take a moment to look at Section 2, Subdivision 1, Unit 8, titled the Outstate Instructional Unit. There is actually no functional outstate instructional unit, so I want would, our employee group would benefit from a clarification. We have five campuses, each with their own unique purpose, degree programs, calendars, and students. <clears throat> the way this is worded is confusing, and I've he heard that from many constituents. If the, if the intent is to remove barriers, lumping independently run and largely unaffiliated professionals together because they're not in the Twin Cities seems problematic. So at the conclusion of my testimony, I do request that the bill's sponsor maybe clarify. I have also received dissenting opinions about the proposed bill because of perceived risks that have not been addressed. Currently, PNA employees have a seat at the table in the shared governance structure at the university. At this point, only non-union employees are included in the Senate structure. Many want to know what happens to that. Others are concerned with the possible loss of flexibility, sick leave, and participation in current retirement programs. I also think it's necessary to recognize the thousands of PNA employees who have not written in and who have not signed a petition. I am concerned that there's still a majority of PNA employees who do not know about this bill. The PNA Senate is using its tools of communication to inform, educate, and um, uh, our constituents, including through our newsletter communication, requesting input, um, hosting conversations as well in our Senate meetings, and, and really encouraging our Senate members, members to reach out to their constituents. Um, <clears throat> the Senate, uh, excuse me. I am a little concerned about the pace of the hearings and the ambiguity, ambiguity that others have experienced when looking at the bill. The university does operate typically with the value of broad consultation. I know that takes time, for better or for worse. It has been important in the past. Um, in closing, I want to challenge the legislature to extend its support to U of M employees beyond power reform. This year, the university has requested funding for core mission support, which includes compensation increases, which is imperative, as you've heard from other testimonies about this bill. Will, Pella, will the Pell reform accomplish what it could, if not equally met, with realistic funding from our state to continue as a premier institution that benefits all Minnesotans through teach, teaching, outreach, and research? And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Frakes. Senator McEwen, anything further before we go to questions? Mm -hmm. Um, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Just a couple of quick things, yes. So I want to just make sure that people are crystal clear about what this bill does and doesn't do, okay? The bill doesn't grant anyone a union or force a reworking of the U's HR structure, okay? 
It gives workers the right to organize if they so choose. And this is a right that Pelra is already supposed to provide. The U has extensive resources already to handle collective bargaining petitions. The prospect of more petitions is not a reason to deny union rights to public employees, particularly rights, again, that they are supposed to already have. This bill gives the U the same time and opportunity to weigh in on appropriate units as any other employee through standard BMS procedures under PELRA. Um, and so just in closing, these, the special rules that are set out currently in Pelra disenfranchise two-thirds of their employees right now and effectively bar them and take away their rights. What this would do is allow them to have the freedom of choice once again, guarantee the rights that they are already supposed to have and fix a problem that has been building for years. This idea that the U hasn't known that this is coming, that this is somehow going too fast, frankly, that is not true at best and disingenuous at worst. The U has known for years that this was a problem. They have had litigation on this. They have not requested one meeting with my office, although this bill has been in the works for months and talk of it has been going for years. So the slow walking that is being attempted right now is just, it's unacceptable. This has been a problem for a long time. It's time for us to restore these rights and respectfully, I ask for your support and to the people who have any issues or problems, my office is open. I will take a meeting at, at your leisure. We'll figure it out. If you have some language changes you'd like to see, come see me. We'll talk about it. But it is our intent to move forward with this bill and to restore the rights of U of M employees. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McEwen. Senator Cran. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Senator McEwen, I can sympathize with the, with the many people. You just said two-thirds of the workforce is disenfranchised. And I would, I, it just, some of that baffles me that two-thirds would be disenfranchised and anybody would still work for any company or, or state agency. That's the part that kind of is, is in conflict in, in my thought process. I was also represented by AFSCME, MMA, MAPE for just under 18 years. And... And I think the problem started, I can sympathize, I think the problem started in, in 1980 when we used the legislature to dictate working conditions and mandate labor agreements and all those types of things or the unionization. This just appears to be another grab and expansion of the union, right? The opportunity's great, go out and create it. But I think that to me the solution would be to get rid of Pelra. And, and every corporation, every business entity has to negotiate and, and make sure that every job is valuable, the pay, the benefits, and all of those things work for both. If not, no one can survive. And so I think uh, this movement just continues the, the legislature playing roles where I don't think it should have started in 1980. Um, I remember that movement. Um, I started at Rev in 83. Um, it hampered and changed the entire structure and the way those agencies performed. Um, limited movement, mobility, and all of those things, and I saw it get worse over my time there. Um, and so I'm also on the side that, in, on, from a labor perspective, right, I was on the subcommittee of employee relations when it mattered, when, when you actually had some minimal oversight from the legislature, from, from public wages. But what we haven't done across the board is change the, the training and the requirements and, and build in the, and bake in the accountability across the board so we could offer comp competitive compensation packages across the board, all of those things. We, we inherently don't have the baked in accountability. And I'd be the front, I've, every, every agency that we've talked to, I think we can, we can do that and make it the world's best workforce. But we have to do those things up front in that training and the accountability that needs to be baked in from the top of the leadership at the University of Minnesota right down to every valuable employee there. We don't deploy those things. We just don't. We don't have, there's some competitive nature in the, in the university market, right? But by the mere fact that it's a government role, the dynamics are very different. It doesn't mean we can't create a crazy dynamic workforce where everybody wins. But we gotta have that first and the commitment to do that and the accountability from the top down and training and, and attachment to every job and role um, so we can get to a point where we offer the ex exciting compensa compensation packages that reward and foster the highest output in the most satisfying work environment. 
Um, I don't think this does it. I don't think it fixes it. I think it, it only makes it more complicated without going after the root cause of the, of the challenge. And it's just not the University of Minnesota. It's, it's all government entities today. So for that, I can't support this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Coran. Senator Anderson. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator McEwen, you had mentioned that this bill has been out there for months. But I see on my, here it says uh, March 4th of 2024 that this was out uh, uh, for the public to, to hear. So I'm just kind of curious as to where the months came into your conversation as far as it being available for University of Minnesota people to uh, have a actual conversation with you regarding it being introduced. Senator McKeon. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator, for that question. I'll clarify um, what I said. I was um, the bill, the the efforts to get the bill together have been going on for more than months. I mean, there have this bill has there has been talk of of needing these changes, as I noted, for years. When I came into the Senate. Um, Three years ago, this issue was introduced to me at that time as a problem um, by constituents up in Duluth. And ever since then, I, I've had periodic conversations with various, as a, look at your packet, all of the different organizations and groups and faculty. This has repeatedly been brought to me as a problem. So. The, and there has been, as I said, litigation, ongoing struggles. The U has actually spent millions of dollars in recent years on outside consultants, hiring law firms to fight unionization efforts. So the money is there. The issue has been in the forefront of what the U has been dealing with. This was obviously in the works. People knew it was in the works. They certainly could have come and talked to me as things started getting moving. Um, but ever since we have introduced the bill and started having hearings, there has been this sort of um, response uh, from some quarters of the U that this is just moving too fast or that this is, um, they're, they're confused about what impact this would have. And, 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 and frankly, Senator, that's just, it's just not true. Uh, they've had plenty of time to prepare. They've had plenty of time to, to put together their own version of how they would like to see changes made, knowing that the, there were already efforts underway to make those changes. And the Minnesota, uh, the courts in our state d had directed the UN and directed the interested parties to come to the legislature for a fix. So they knew that this was coming. They should have had things queued up. And as soon as this bill was dropped, they should have been in my office. And, and that hasn't happened. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator McQuaid and Senator Fate, I do see your name. You will be next. Senator McQuaid. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator McEwen, for bringing this bill forward. <clears throat> um, this is a pretty dense list of people to come together in one month if this bill hadn't been talked about. You can't write letters like these and collect signatures like these in a month if, if people haven't been doing the work. You know, I, I am um, married to a gopher and I'm the daughter of a gopher. <laughs> but I have to say that I was really, really disheartened by interim president's comments. Um, you know, we regularly receive feedback from employees is what People who hate unions say, that is what corporations say when they're, you don't need a union, we listen to you all the time. Of course they listen to individual people. The point of a union is to organize together to change the conditions under which you work. And if you're having an individual conversation and then another individual conversation, there's never pressure and there's never that collective power to make those changes. There was nothing successful for unions about the 80s. Certainly not this language. <laughs> Literally in, across the entire country. I, I, I really don't want us to talk about any work that we did for unions in the 80s as being successful because it, it wasn't. It was actually specifically to union bust, which is what this is. And Senator McKeon, my question for you is, am I correct in understanding that the U of M Twin Cities campus is the only one that has this special, uh, you know, whatever this is, and that the other ones do not? Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator McQuaid. I do have an expert on that very question that I'd like to just address your question real quick. Um, please state your name and position for the record and then answer the question, please. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Meg Luger Nikolai. I'm an attorney with Education Minnesota, which works in partnership with the American Association of University Professors and the Teamsters and other uh, others on this legislation. And Madam Chair, oh, I'm sorry, I'm also a daughter of Chisago County, so I really hope to turn Senator Corrin's heart on this. Um, I, to your question, Senator May Quaid, these are statutory bargaining units for the University of Minnesota system. So individuals in those, for example, in the PNA unit or in the PNA unit throughout the system, Crookston, um, Duluth, Morris, and the Twin Cities flagship campus. And additionally, we'd just like to note that there is an outstate instructional unit. It exists. It consists of Crookston and Duluth faculty who are represented in supporting this bill as well. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and, and thank you for that. That's super helpful because I'm just working my way through it. I think I'm having a really hard time reading what they're supposed, what these bargaining units are supposed to be, because it's really haphazard. But I, I really appreciate the work that you put into this, Senator McEwen, and all of the various stakeholders you brought together through it. It is um, amazing to read letters from, you know, a doctor who graduated from college the same year I did, who is still in his 15th year of study, it would seem, and went through, I'm assuming, a whole life between when we graduated from college and today, and to not have any bargaining rights about the conditions under which you work um, is just heartbreaking to hear. And so this is a very, very vitally important bill, and all of the work that everybody has done bringing this together, sharing their stories, I, I'm really appreciative of it. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Fate. And please unmute yourself just as a reminder. Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you also, Senator McEwen, for uh, bringing this forward. Um, I have a question and um, then a comment. I guess my question is for um, the university, if they have consulted with um, the regents on this. I it is my understanding that they're the ones that set the legislative agenda. So I wanted to see if they have been consulted. Thank you, Senator McEwen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think that that question was maybe for the university, not for me. Correct. Yes. I apologize. Uh, thank and you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Fate. Um, the first that I'm aware of that the university was made aware of this bill was uh, I heard about it on March 5th when I was up here testifying on our capital budget request. The Board of Regents has approved three areas of request for this year's legislative session. Uh, this bill was neither on their radar nor have they had any official meeting that I'm aware of to discuss the bill. I am aware that your packet includes a letter from three of the regents who in their individual capacity are speaking in favor of the bill and, and they certainly have the right to do that. But to my knowledge, no, the Board of Regents has not had any opportunity as a group or any publicly noticed meeting to discuss this bill at all. Senator Fate, anything further? Yeah, um, no, thank you. That That's helpful. Um, and uh, I just, again, I wanted to just say thank you to Senator McCoon, um, both as a member of this committee, but also as a chair of higher ed. This is one of the, our priorities also. And um, I, pre I really appreciate you uh, fighting for the workers. Uh, we have one of the testifiers speaking. Um, I think her name is Dr. Holcomb. I wrote it down, uh, talking about how this is causing direct harm to her and thousands of workers that are just like her contingent faculty. and other workers that are uh, being um, underpaid tragically and unable to organize. And um, she and other testifiers also mentioned other workers doing the same work, but separated in, I think, different units. It's just an unnecessary and unjust setup. So again, as the chair, I just wanted to say that I'm really proud of the work that you're doing, Jen, or Senator Mikuin, I'm sorry, um, to end explo exploitation of university workers and creating a pathway for them to exercise just the basic right to organize. And I believe that the university should have been uh, supporting these workers all along who wanted to unionize them. And I believe that they're more than able and uh, capable to handle this. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Fate. And you were correct. The name was uh, Dr. Holcomb. That was that testimony you referred to. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like a roll call vote. Thank you, Senator Anderson. Senator May Quaid. Thank you. And um, Interim President Endinger, don't go too far. I actually have a question for you. Interim President, if you could please come back up. Senator May Quaid. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. President, I'm wondering, am I supposed to call you that, Mr. President? Um, Mr. Edinger. Um, 
There was a 2016 effort, I believe, by, by faculty to, to unionize. Um, can you talk to me about what has changed in these conversations where you get feedback since that unionization effort that you, that, yeah, just tell me about what has changed since then, since that happened. Um, Go ahead. Honestly, Senator, I would not really be in a position to do that. Um, as an interim president who's been there 10 months, I, I just don't have the background back to that. I, I'm sure our team would be happy to provide supplemental information that could get at that question if you'd prefer. If you could do that, that would be wonderful. Thank yeah, you. And, Madam Senator Chair, McQuaid. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I think the, the bigger question is, um, I'd really like to understand from the university's perspective of why, of why they don't think all of this is coming from some place that's real and, um, and why Worker, I mean, it really seems to me that they were working, trying to work with the university and are coming to the legislature to be like, we keep running into this being told that the statute is why we can't unionize and organize ourselves into to bargaining units that makes sense. And so if, if changing that so they can do that is not the answer, I'd love to know um, the working conditions under which they are existing, um, what has been done to address the concerns that they were probably wanting to organize around. So that, that's the information I'm looking for. President Edinger. Yeah, thank you, Senator. Thank you, Chair Mitchell. Um, we appreciate the input that we've received. Um, the stories that have been told are certainly uh, meaningful. Uh, we agree that the way the law was established 40 years ago, it is required to basically then go back through the legislature to reestablish new groups. Our only concern has been that, you know, notwithstanding what, what was represented earlier, that we're supposed to have known that this bill was coming. It's we, we were not provided any opportunity to have input in the bill. I'm not aware of anyone, at least in my administrative team, who was provided with any advanced copies of the bill. And to say, yeah, I mean, yes, it's, it's impressive that a lot of people have spoken up for it, and I do think ultimately we do need to make changes for it. But as PNA Chair uh, Taha Frakes testified to you, she's part of the PNA committee, she has thousands of members who had no idea this bill was going on, really don't know what to think about it. And our normal process, it may seem slow to the outside world, and I've only been interim president 10 years. I came from the outside world. I was in business, which I admit works much more quickly sometimes than a university. But a university's process through consultative government it is multiple committees. We have a PNA group, which was hers. We have a faculty group. We have a student group. We have a civil service group. And to just kind of get a bill dropped on us on March 5th, and then have to respond within a couple of weeks to change something that's been in place for 40 years, we think is not the best way to tackle this issue. Thank you. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, Senator McEwen, for being such a fierce advocate um, for workers and unions and labor. My question is around, um, are, do are medical residents and fellows included in this? Okay, I'll take that as a yes. Thank you, Senator McEwen. Yes, definitely. Are. Senator McEwen says yes. Okay, and I just, you know, it's been a couple of years since I was a resident. <laughs> just two or three, Senator just Morrison, I'm couple. sure. Just a couple, but back in the day, you know, I worked 100 hour weeks. Luckily, there have been improvements in those um, laws since then, and I didn't train at the U. I can't imagine having a moment for a meeting, much less organizing. Um, but I'm just wondering, I know that I'm aware that the U's training, they go to many different hospitals. And I'm just wondering how this would work, what this would look like if there's anyone who's able to address that piece. I just know we, we train most of the medical professionals in Minnesota and I just want to make sure that we're able to continue doing that. Uh, we have someone standing up as tribute. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, and, and uh, Madam Chair, and thank you for the question, Senator Morrison. We'll see if we can get an answer, but I will note that at the last hearing that we had in higher ed, we actually had a large contingent of medical students all wearing their lab coats as a show of solidarity for this bill. So with that. I'm and just quick, the person standing Mr. Up, Hortzman, our if you want to swap spots as well, and so I can first go to, um, if you want to state your name for the record and answer the question, and then Mr. Hortzman, if you want to do the same. Madam Chair, Meg Luger-Nikolai, still Education Minnesota in partnership with AAUP. Senator Morrison, do you mind repeating your question? I, I think I understand, but I just want to make sure I have it. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Certainly. I, I just want to understand how this would work for medical residents and fellows, given that they go to many different hospitals, how they're paid. I'm just not sure how that works at the U. 
Uh, Ms. Luger, do you want the answer to go to Mr. Hortzman or? Yeah, that'd be great. Mr. Hortzman. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, my name is Ken Hortzman. I'm the Vice President for Human Resources at the university. Um, currently, the way the medical residents are situated, uh, we have approximately 780 medical residents and then another 256 fellows that are in what we call our graduate medical education uh, program. And those are accredited programs. Uh, so there are over a thousand active, uh, what I'll call GME residents and fellows that train in these. And um, there are over, a, there are approximately 120 different programs. So um, the way it works, uh, with our um, partner hospitals, of which there are uh, 10 or 11 different hospital systems that they work in, is we actually rec recoup what would be the full-time equivalent um, cost from the hospitals because that is where they work. Uh, typically, uh, if we went forward and there was a labor negotiation for this, uh, it would be between the employer and the employee group. It would not be insurmountable to figure that out. Um, but it is complex. It would take time. Um, I've heard that we are well situated to take on a number of organizing efforts and this kind of work, which I think speaks to what we have to have take time to, to uh, work through. We are not. Um, and I think when we look at our peer institutions, uh, that have gone through uh, more labor organizing than we, they, they are staffed at a much higher level uh, for labor relations. There are one-time costs for system updates uh, and for classification work, uh, benefit reviews and the like. So that would occur, um, but it's also, uh, there is probably some risk with those relationships with those 11 hospitals. What I would say currently, uh, just if I may, there is a, uh, a f there are forums and representation set up among re medical residents that meet quarterly at the university. They have a space to bring forward their issues. There is a council that reviews that, that they elect uh, people out of their, their peer group to serve on. And they do inform on things like raises and compensation. And just for medical residents uh, over the last several years in 22, 23 academic year, their increase was four and a half percent. This current year it was 6% and we're looking at a similar range next year. Uh, we do compare ourselves to metro areas like Chicago for pay. So I'm not saying that is the sum total of what they would like to see improve. Right. If but, we can stick to the questions, because okay. I am really Sorry. trying to be mindful of time okay. and I the apologize. context of what the apologize. question asked is. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Senator Morrison, are you good? No. Madam Chair, uh, that was actually very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Just, Ms. Luger. I'll make it snappy. I, Madam Chair, the what I'd like to clarify is that the, this bill is not intended to and would not change those relationships as they fundamentally exist. It would affect individuals' ability to bargain over their working conditions. Nor would it change the consultation process because of the existence of meet and confer language that already exists in Pelra and would also be unchanged by this bill. Thank you. Yeah. Senator Cran. Oh, okay, thank you. Seeing no further questions. Senate, um, Senator McQuaid moves that Senate file 4597 um, as amended be recommended to pass and re referred to the Labor Committee. Madam Chair, did we re request a roll call? We did. Thank you. Yes, there was a roll call. Uh, can you please take the roll? Chair Mitchell? Aye. Chair Dietzik? Aye. Senator Anderson? No. Senator Barr? No. Senator Carlson? Yes. Senator Swadzinski? Yep. Senator Driskowski? No. Senator Fate? Aye. Senator Gustafson? Yes. Senator Jasinski? Senator Coran? Aye. Or, I'm sorry. Okay. 
Can you please repeat Senator that? Senator Jasinski, could you repeat what you said? <laughs> Senator Jasinski, we do not have your vote. <laughs> Senator Coran? No. Senator Lang? Aye. Senator May Quaid? Aye. Senator Morrison? Krasinski votes no. Can I do it? There being eight yes votes and six no votes, the motion the motion prevails. Uh, Senate file 4597 as adopted passes and is re-referred, or I'm sorry, as amended, not adopted, uh, is passed and is re-referred to the Labor Committee. Thank you, Senator McCune. Thank you very much. Senator Westland, if you could please move forward and with as much. I will ask whether you are. Thank you. <laughs> What's that? Sometimes it feels slightly like it. <laughs> Senator Westland uh, has Senate file 2915. Please proceed. Thank you very much. I do have an A4 amendment, but uh, let me just briefly present the bill. Proceed, please. If everyone could exit as quietly as possible, <laughs> since we still have agenda items. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, what you have before you today, uh, committee members, is the Consumer Data Privacy Act. Uh, this bill is a, cons a comprehensive consumer data privacy protection bill and would establish a new chapter in state law. Currently in Minnesota, we have the Government Data Practices Act, which controls how government data is collected, created, stored, used, and released. The Minnesota Consumer Data Privacy Act before you would deal with data that is in private hands. The bill recognizes that Minnesota consumers deserve, deserve rights when it comes to aspects of their personal data. This bill outlines five new rights that Minnesotans would have under this bill. The right to access personal data that a controller has collected about them. The right to correct inaccuracies in their personal data. The right to delete their personal data. The right to obtain a copy of their personal data from the controller and the right to opt out of the sale of the personal data, the processing of personal data for the purposes of targeted advertising, and profiling that may have legal or other significant impact. Um, the A4 amendment uh, to the bill um, is being offered. Uh, this bill is traveling in the other body, um, and we are trying to keep it as closely aligned as possible. Uh, many of the parts of the A4 amendment are technical in nature. Um, the, there are some additional categories of information that are excluded, and that would be found in lines 1.2 to 1.9. There are some additional considerations um, being added for determining if personal data was inaccurate and what the consumer right is to have it corrected. Uh, line one. Page one, line 12, narrows the topic on which a consumer's aid, uh, agent may exercise the right to opt out. 13 is a technical correction. 14 through 16 specifies how a controller's technology platform can meet the requirement to determine if a consumer is a Minnesota resident, basically by IP address. Line 17 through 19, um, again, tightens the language and deletes some steps that the controller has to take for an appeal by a consumer. Line 21, 20 to 21 requires a controller to provide a written explanation for their decision not to take an action requested by a consumer. Line 22 is technical. Line 23 is technical. Uh, line 24 changes the description of documentation that a controller has to maintain. Uh, 25 is technical, 26 adds risk assessments to the list of things that must be described in the controller's documentation. Uh, lines 27 through 28 eliminates a limit on internal operations a controller's authorized to perform. 
um, 29 and then on page two, line one, um, uh, deals with the effective date and the applicability of the effective date. Um, so I uh, would would appreciate if somebody on the committee would offer the A4 amendment. Senator Carlson uh, offers the A4 amendment with the amendment described and seeing no questions. All in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The amendment is adopted. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I guess um, maybe question for council. I believe that the two sections that fall under the jurisdiction of the committee would be section 12 and section 13 specifically. Um, section 12 deals with attorney general enforcement. This consumer data privacy bill does not include a private right of action. Um, any enforcement measures would be through the attorney general's office. And then there is also in section 13, is the um, preemption um, that this chapter would supersede and preempt any other um, laws and ordinances by local governments uh, to ensure that everything is being enforced on the state level. And I am, I am happy to answer questions. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any questions for the author? Senator Cran. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Wesson. On the one, I, I guess, when you look at the criteria, it, it looks when you have a commercial relationship, right, with a with whatever whoever that is. But what it doesn't seem to cover, and I think we all have, I think, worked with Senator Elkin or uh, Representative Elkins, and, and the hard part is is trying to figure out how the heck does a, a business manage this, right, and how does an individual have have access and rights to. One, they don't even know where their data is, more or less a business to be able to go out and allow an individual to come in and, and uh, remove that data themselves or, or even know where, where it goes. I, I get it, but what we don't cover is kind of where, where is the, uh, when, the, when the consumer is the product, <laughs> all the data that's harvested on you individually that's far more tenuous than anything that you would likely have with a personal business relationship with, with, with anybody that's kind of covered or highlighted, highlighted in the bill. So I struggle with, I think there's a foundation here, but I struggle with understanding how this could be implemented um, for all the businesses. So I, I don't have a specific question on it, but I just struggle with how do we get to a point where we have full, full you know, protection and consumer rights. That's what, that's what we're looking for. Um, but all across social media platforms and as well as the, those that are direct. So um, we'll be watching it closely. So thank you. Thank you. And Senator, Senator Mitchell, Weston. all I would say is that um, absolutely the best remedy for consumer data privacy issues would probably be for some sort of federal um, legislation that would apply to all 50 states. And in the absence of that, you have individual states trying to do what they can to protect citizens. Um, this bill has um, uh, focused on um, Connecticut, Oregon, um, Colorado, um, some provisions from Texas, uh, and trying to take the best, really, of, of all of those um, that have been implemented. And I am sure that uh, this particular bill and this particular legislation is not a one and done uh, thing at all. This is highly technical and something we'll have to probably continue to address. Thank you, Senator Westland. Senator Anderson. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. In the title, it says here that this is, you're providing for enforcement by the Attorney General. Has there been a fiscal note then requested for this? Is there one that's available for us? Senator Wesson? Thank you. Um, thank you for asking the question. This is actually going to be um, put into the Commerce Omnibus Bill, which is so this will be headed back to Commerce. There was a fiscal note, and I believe it was somewhere in the neighborhood of 688,000. Let's see. Uh, Mr. Erickson. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair and members, there is a, a fiscal note on a previous version of the bill. I believe there's a new fiscal note request that's in the system. Uh, but to Senator Westland's point, the, the, the Attorney General identified $644,000 uh, of costs relating to new staff uh, who'd be required to bring the enforcement actions that Senator Westland described. They also report um, some offsetting revenues, but I think there's some question about whether those could be tracked as offsetting. But that might be for the Commerce Committee to, to figure out in the omnibus. 
Thank you. Madam Chair. Senator Anderson. Mr. Erickson, how many new staff are, is the Attorney General requesting? Mr. Erickson. Uh, Madam Chair and Senator Anderson, they are showing, uh, I see there's an attorney and a legal assistant. I, let me see if, if they have the um, FTE value on that. Two FTE attorneys and one FTE investigator necessary to perform the enforcement activities uh, is what I'm seeing. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Anderson? Good. Nothing at this time. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, Senator Gustafson moves that Senate File 2915, as amended, be recommended to pass and re referred to the Commerce and Consumer Protection Committee. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. No. The motion prevails. Senate file 2915 as recommended as passes and is re-referred to the Commerce and Consumer Protection Committee. Thank you. I told you I'd be fast. Thank you. Senator Dibble, we have about 10 minutes. We got a time Wait, this, nobody this room. Senator Dibble is here to present Senate File 5220, or I'm sorry, 5244. Please proceed. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll pare down my 25-minute presentation. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, seriously, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, should we start uh, with the amendment, the A2? Yes, please. And this is the first stop for this. Yes. So we have the A2 amendment uh, to get this in the order that the author wants. Uh, Senator Swazinski offers the A2 amendment. All, or all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The A2 amendment is adopted. Please proceed. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members, for the opportunity to present uh, Senate file number 5244. I'd also like to thank my co-authors, uh, Senators Limmer, Hoffman, Westrom, and Mohammed. Uh, and just very quickly, uh, Madam Chair, this bill comes out of a discussion about how to respond to what most would agree was a very shocking decision from the Minnesota Court of Appeals last year, known as the Zika case, which found that uh, those subject to guardianship in Minnesota had no civil recourse for abuse of the most egregious forms at the hands of their guardians. And so that um, discussion um, is being, was, was, was sparked, um, and, uh, and there was a large convening of all the people who are involved in guardianship, both those who are subject to guardianship, providing guardianship, and those who are in the advocacy uh, community. The specific uh, issue itself around immunity and qualified immunity is being handled separately through the judiciary, um, but in, as a part and parcel of that conversation, a lot of questions uh, have, have been raised around guardianship um, and how it's construed in, in Minnesota uh, and, and whether or not any substantive and meaningful changes uh, would need to be made. That is actually a conversation that's been going on for uh, quite a few years, uh, both in the disability community as well as the elder care communities. Uh, and there are a lot of questions about the totality of guardianship and whether or not there should be some interim steps and the, the level and extent of, of the suspension of an individual's civil rights, whether uh, interim steps around supported decision making, et cetera. You can see, Madam Chair, uh, in the list of duties, the, the n number and nature of questions um, that have arisen on the subject. So uh, very quickly to the bill, um, I think we did a pretty good job of tending to all of the elements um, that uh, are, are called for in the formation of advisory groups, councils, task forces, commissions, and legis legislative commissions in terms of establishing a name, a specific number of folks. I believe the count here is 26 uh, with the amendment, um, as well as who has the authority to make those appointments. Um, uh, you'll see that uh, we've tended to, uh, who is to convene 
the organization. It's the Minnesota Council on Disabilities. We'll be hearing from Mr. Turner in just a moment uh, and who's going to chair the group and how it's going to be convened initially and who's going to staff and support, again, the Minnesota Council on Disabilities. Um, we've dealt with the question of compensation for members uh, and then the duties and then the accountabilities. There's a report to be made uh, and, uh, and then the, the task force would then um, sunset after the, the, the report is delivered to the legislature. Um, it will take an appropriation. Uh, we're not sure. Uh, well, there is a fiscal note. I don't know if you want to deal with that here. Um, we're going to move on to human services, um, where I know the Senator Bill as well. So that's the very high level overview. We have uh, Chris Sundberg from uh, Elder Voices and Trevor Turner from Minnesota Council on Disabilities who can speak uh, to why this is a good idea. Um, and as well, uh, Madam Chair, you'll see a number of letters from a wide array of organizations who want to have this convening and this conversation over the next couple of years. Thanks, Thank Madam you. Chair. Everyone has all of that in their packets. Um, Ms. Sundberg, if you could put, proceed with your testimony, if it's possible to make it brief, that would be lovely. I will do so. Thank you, uh, Chair and members of the committee. I'm Chris Sundberg, and I'm Executive Director of Elder Voice Advocates. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization dedicated to championing quality care and protecting the rights of both elders and people with disabilities. We strongly support this bill. Since our inception in 2017, we've encountered numerous instances of guardianship rights violations and neglect. Minnesota can do much better in protecting the rights of vulnerable adults, better preparing guardians to understand their responsibilities, consider less restrictive alternatives, and prevent abuse, neglect, and exploitation. Uh, our engagement with many stakeholders over the past few months have shown a strong conviction that now is the time to re-examine our guardianship uh, system and outcomes for this. Uh, in conclusion, I would just say that the transparency that this task force will offer is paramount. It's uh, openly, will engage with experts, with holding diverse uh, perspectives, and listen to the firsthand experiences of vulnerable adults and formulate uh, recommendations for public policy. And we firmly believe that the Minnesota Council on Disability is best suited to convene this task force. Thank you. Thank you, and that was wonderfully concise. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Turner. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Trevor Turner, and I am the Public Policy Director for the Minnesota Council on Disability. Um, over the years that I've served with the Minnesota Council on Disabilities, um, I've heard countless stories of uh, those under guardianship who have faced abuse, neglect, and violations of their basic human rights. And many individuals under guardianship are at risk of exploitation and neglect due to inadequate safeguards and alternative pathways. Um, when I've sat down with constituents and stakeholders um, who are advocating for guardianship reform and I've asked them, you know, what needs to change, um, you know, I get a lot of different answers and a lot of different uh, things that need to be addressed. And so this is why a task force on guardianship reform um, is necessary to uh, convene the multitude of stakeholders and advocates to produce a, a cohesive policy proposal that will update our guardianship system for the 21st century, as well as explore alternatives to guardianship like supported decision making. Um, currently, the process for terminating guardianship can be complex and challenging, and making it difficult for individuals to regain control over their lives. Um, you might be aware of high-profile celebrities who have been subjected to guardianship, like Britney Spears, or the football star and inspiration for the movie The Blind Side, Michael Orr. Um, if these wealthy s celebrities and uh, influential stars can struggle to regain their independence, imagine how hard it is for an average person under guardianship. Um, last summer, I met an autistic young man at the state fair who told me my parents put me under guardianship when I turned 18 and I want out, please help me. Um, and unfortunately, there weren't, wasn't much I could do about it. And so uh, guardianship in this situation is often overused and this uh, young man would have been better served under supported decision making and other independent focused disability services. Um, so finally, there are already a lot of momentum from the disability community and stakeholders to have a discussion uh, with an outcome-driven approach, which is this task force will deliver. Um, the news of the potential establishment of the task force um, under guardianship reform is spreading fast, 
and MCD has already received dozens of requests from those wanting to be a part of the task force and a part of the conversation. So the time for this task force on guardianship reform is now. Um, I'd like to thank Senator Dibble for carrying this bill, and I urge members of this committee to support this bill and support Senate File 5244 and support the independence of Minnesotans with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Seeing no Senator Coran. Madam Chair, I always miss you when you turn and look and left. I, here, but so. I look every time I and then you <laughs> wait until I turn the other way. <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Dibble, I, I'm glad you brought it forward. I, I, although everybody's heard me rail on task forces and, and, uh, and the composition, but I looked in the number of people on there. But gone through it, it is all the people necessary to be functional and, and uh, to provide broad oversight. All of us have had the stories of, you know, in the group home environment, I've had multiple people just in my district where this professional industry um, comes out and seeks guardianship without contact or information um, with the current provider in that group home. And it's interesting, uh, one, uh, more so in the task force of, one, that that occurs, but two, I look at, well, what state agency provided them with the information to go out and obtain that, right? So, so I would hope the task force would be broad in spectrum for all those scenarios that exist and not just look at you know uh, uh, specific ones, but it goes back to how could an agency, how could that nonprofit entity even know where these people exist? Those aren't public records. They had to have legitimate information either from a county personnel or state personnel um, to be able to go out and identify those specific individuals and then seek guardianship of them without any communication with the current provider. And in many cases, those are the only homes that some people have known. Depends on the severity, you know, the, and, and some truly need, are, are, are in a guardianship because of their, their physical disabilities if you look at some of the most medically fragile people we have. And, and when you see somebody preying on that industry, that is their only family. The caretakers for them become their family. And it's the best living environment that we could ever dream of providing. And to think that somebody could come in and go and seek guardianship and obtain it without any any truly driven need. And if the if the group home hasn't determined it, then who the hell would? Um, but I thank you. And uh, if there's an opportunity, I don't know where you're at on it, but I will certainly uh, I would certainly be interested in participating. So thanks, thanks, Senator Devil. Thank, thank you, Senator Cran. And I'll just add to what you're saying. Two things. One is. Um, there was an opportunity, of course, on Monday and at the Audit Commission to ask the audit, the legislative auditor um, to provide some of this data um, that <clears throat> then can inform the work of the task force. So it's my uh, plug to you to <laughs> encourage you to vote for that when we're together on Monday. We both serve on the Audit Commission, Madam Chair. Uh, secondly, um, there are numerous stories about um, not just uh, folks who are under guardianship, but how they come into guardianship and the lack of due process and, um, you know, whether or not the, the, the bench, the judiciary is really taking a hard look at how people are coming into guardianship in the first place. And then, of course, they're, the judiciary is responsible for managing um, and how close attention are they really paying to those who are subject to guardianship. Seeing no further questions or comments, Senator Coran, would you like to move this? What's that? Would you care to move this? Yes, I'd like to move the Senate file. Where are we at? Senator Coran moves that Senate file 5244 be recommended to pass and as amended and re-referred to Human Services Committee. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Senate file, uh, the motion prevails. Senate file 5244 as amended has passed. It is re-referred to the Human Services Committee. Thank you all. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. With that, the last two agenda items will be moved to Tuesday's agenda and um, the Committee on State and Local Government and Veterans concludes its business for today. We are adjourned.